Hey everybody, tonight we're debating whether or not Christianity is reasonable and we are starting right now. With Stuart's opening statement, thanks so much for being with us, Stuart. The floor is all yours. Thank you, James, for having me. Appreciate you, Matt, for another one. Always love these. So, is Christianity rational? Got to start out with the leader of the faith, whether he actually was, did he claim to be God? Did he have the character to be God? And I would say the claims were there. You certainly have it throughout the Gospels. You definitely have it in John with the seven I am statements he makes. But then he also receives worship. He doesn't reject worship like the apostles do at times, like Paul did when he tore his clothes, or like when the angels even were rejecting worship. He also claimed to forgive sins. And so throughout, he's pretty consistent in the claim to be God. Secondly, the character. That's a big one for me. I think if somebody who comes is just a, a lunatic or somebody who doesn't connect with us emotionally, psychologically, in a way where we perhaps long for something like relationships and love, if we don't have somebody like that that we can connect with, then I would question whether that was truly God or not. And I think he came right from the get-go saying crazy stuff in a culture that was all power-driven and all about violence and oppressing people who are lower down the rung on the socioeconomic or ethnic ladder. And yet he comes in and says, turn the other cheek, forgive 70 times seven, look out for the oppressed and look out for the poor and marginalized. And when you look deeply into his character, it's incredible how he combines things. He has these virtues within his character that let's just say are inc incompatible for most of us. He doesn't have these crazy temperaments. We can flare up. I, I have a temperament at times to tremendously get angry on the basketball court, for example. But you never see this with him. He's always controlled. He, he always has this type of meekness, which is not weakness, but power constrained. And he, I mean, think about the combination as well. It's strikingly beautiful because he combines this kind of high majesty, claim to be God, and he has tremendous humility. He, he joins this commitment of justice with astonishing mercy and grace at the same time. He reveals a transcendent self-sufficiency and yet entire trust on God the Father. So he has this type of humility as well, but no uncertainty, um, really, accompanied, really accompanied by a towering type of confidence. And so you get the character. I think he comes at the right time, too. A lot of people oftentimes say, well, he should come today. Wouldn't that make the most sense? Well, we could see that in every day and age, I think. You know, uh, 2,000 years ago, I think it would make a lot of sense because you got the Pax Romana. you got the 200 years of peace. You've got all those wars dying down between all those warring civilizations. So it gave an opportunity for the trade routes to open up as well. You have the spiritual hunger. You know, Larry Hurtado out of Marquette University talked about how there was this vast spiritual hunger and a disillusionment with certain types of gods, for example, in the polytheistic culture. And now all of a sudden you have Jesus Christ coming. And the reason why Christianity was so attractive in that day and age was, one, because you could have actually a personal relationship with the God. Two, that God forgave sins and gave you a second, third, and fourth opportunity to actually live a life. And you weren't condemned to something like a shame and guilt, like in a shame and honor society. And then so spiritually, and then thirdly and finally, after his ascension, so 70 AD, what you have with, with Christ, and you, you have to, to break down the temple. And now what happens? Persecution starts and the total dispersion of Christians. And so that's when they go and take over the world. And so it makes sense for those three reasons that he came when he did. Uh, he affirms and convicts every culture. I like that. I think that makes sense with the God. Uh, the reliability of the Gospels, I think, are pretty obvious. You got the manuscripts and the dates, 5,800 manuscripts. You get the dates within 15 years, probably even closer to the events themselves. You have the church fathers. You take away all the manuscripts themselves, you still have the church fathers counting up for over 1 million New Testament quotes. I mean, that's, that's pretty impressive. You know, there was never a time when any one man or a group of men had control over the text of the New Testament. There was never this Christian Utman. All claims that there were changes in theology or doctrine are simply without merit. Um, you had the Christian church was obviously a persecuted minority without power to enforce a uniform textual transmission like Islam. Uh, that's, that's why it's bogus to think that Constantine 325 or around then would have had some power to change things. He didn't. It was, it was a persecuted minority from the get-go. And then you got the resurrection. Evidence, I would take a cumulative case, typically. One, witnesses and how they reported. Two, skeptics that converted. Three, expectation of the gospel, the way it was presented and the way it was received. Four, Jewish background and understanding of what they were expecting. 
five, voluntary persecution and suffering, six, immediate proclamation, seven, empty tomb, eight, the use of women as eyewitnesses, which would have been thrown out, and then nine, I would have said just the start of the early church, how it was a major paradigm shift overnight, which typically would have taken hundreds of years for that many people to have shifted from something like Judaism to Christianity. Both Christians and atheists cherry pick the Bible, I would say. I, I think it's important to, to look at, to see if Christianity is truly rational, you have to go from cover to cover and you have to see, okay, are there beautiful things in the characteristics of God? Is he inconsistent? Is he consistent? How do I go about not just picking on his wrath or just taking him as this God of love and grace? No, there's obviously a combination of the two. And so cherry picking from Christians and atheists happens all the time. And that's when I start to see a straw man that is frustrating for me to see. Failed Messiah movements. Why in the world did Jesus Christ Messiah movement work? We have at least 10 on record that failed total flop. Uh, Chuck Colson. I love how at Watergate with Nixon, he talked about how, you know, they couldn't keep that conspiracy quiet for longer than two weeks. So if this was simply some kind of crazy hoax and conspiracy that was going on with the resurrection, think about how many years that conspiracy and hoax has been able to stay quiet. It's, it's pretty impressive. Then you got all kinds of external evidence. You know, you talk about Lucian, Suetonius, Tacitus, plenty outside of the Bible. You have the coherency of scripture. And then you get down to thinking about how does it, does this thing really work experientially in my life? And this is the one I always focus on because I think about how secular humanism so frequently lands on humanity is good, set up the right social constructions and humanity is, is innately fine. It's great. It's good. And I'm more of the Sigmund Freud approach, which is no, we, we have a semi good side. We also have an id. And that is, I would call, connected to original sin. And so that makes sense for me. That makes sense for me. We got to have some type of name for it or we start to lose ourselves. And then I would say Christianity makes the most sense when it comes to our incredible devotion as a society now to justice and to helping those who are outside of our own social circle or even national circle. What's the reasoning behind it? From an evolutionary perspective, everything is just supposed to be naturally violent. And yet, why do we all of a sudden have just this incredible focus to help those who are different from us in ways that doesn't benefit us at all? And I would say the Judeo-Christian values are the reason why. They've come into our culture, and they've radically impacted things. And so you see things like sympathy, compassion, agape love, sacrificial love. You see things like hope. You know, we are irredeemably hope-based creatures. And... I don't think you can get there without a firm, eternal understanding of what hope is. Because so often here, you know, you look at suicide rates now. They're up 700% in women. Um, they're supposed to double. You know, you look at anxiety and depression on college campuses, over 50%. I see this all the time. And I'm thinking, how do you infuse young ones, but old ones too? with a, a strong sense of hope and what really hope is, not just this type of Pollyanna type optimism, because it has to be deeper than that. Because the number one reason why someone commits suicide is hopelessness and a lack of meaning. And so the Christian hope is both personal and cultural. You know, you look at, for example, Andrew DeBlanco wrote this book, A Meditation on Hope, not a Christian, he's an atheist, but he charts how, you know, originally our nation focused on God. And self-sacrifice, not self-assertion that we see like today, just fulfill my own personal you know, needs in a selfish kind of way. Instead, it was live for God, sacrifice for others. Then it turned more so into live for nation. You know, go be in the military, sacrifice for your country. But now it's live for self and the individual. And we see the radical breakdown sociologically, individually, that has taken place. So going back to God, that's the rationality of Christianity. It makes sense. It just fits versus what Gary Hauerwas would talk about. Again, not a Christian, but he talks about how there, there's a, an awareness of things that are missing in the secular worldview. And I would leave it with that. How do you explain your experience, your lived out experience when it comes to your worldview? Thank you very much for that opening, Stuart. And... <clears throat> 
want to say thanks so much for your opening, Stuart. want to say, folks, if it's your first time here at Modern Day Debate, we are a neutral platform hosting debates on science, religion, and politics. We hope you feel welcome no matter what walk of life you are from, Christian, atheists, and all of the strange creatures in between. We're glad that you are here, as well as, folks, a quick housekeeping thing. Modern Day Debate has expanded onto TikTok. If you didn't know this, we're thrilled about this. Once we hit 1,000 followers over there, we'll be able to live stream our debates there too which will be huge so i want to say if you haven't yet i want to encourage you to follow our tiktok i'll pin that at the top of the live chat right now and it's also in the description box if you will follow us there we appreciate that with that we're going to kick it over to matt thanks so much matt for being with us the floor is all yours hey my pleasure and thanks to Stuart for this i think we actually got set up i was joking earlier that somebody came into one of the shows i was doing is like do you think that Stuart and, and his dad are, are rational? And I was like, not when it comes to the religion. And right off the bat, like two days later, it was, hey, you want to do this debate? So here I am. <laughs> um, I also evidently just minimized the whole Zoom thing. Oh, well, we'll just trust that it works. So the question is, is Christ Christianity rational? And uh, the answer is no. And with from a philosophical perspective, I actually have friends who will not debate this subject. They're not going to debate uh, whether or not Christianity is rational because within philosophy, there's this notion of internal consistency and something is rational if it's internally consistent. But internal consistency isn't enough. Um, fantasy games with a rule setting for their magic system can be internally consistent. Uh, Mario is internally consistent. You have a certain jump height maximum, run down maximum. Even using the game uh, glitches to, to do a speed run is consistent, which is why you can have tool assisted speed runs. Sorry if I'm getting all geeky on everybody, but it would be irrational to claim that Mario can violate the rules of the game. And it, or if you prefer Dungeons and Dragons has a magic system and a set of rules that govern that aspect of the game. And as long as an act within the game is consistent with those rules, it's rational. That type of rationality does us no good. Internal consistency isn't relevant to what we're talking about today. In order for something to be rational, it needs to be consistent with the facts of reality. The miraculous, the supernatural, are irrational. They do not conform to the order of reason and logic within reality. Now, irrational doesn't mean false. That we don't know or understand something or can't rationally defend it doesn't mean it's not true. Christianity could be both irrational and true. There just wouldn't be any reliable way to know whether or not it's true. And you have to have a testable, falsifiable proposition or hypothesis. Um, rational and reasonable, I'm going to use probably as synonyms for throughout this debate. But at one point, it was reasonable to believe that the sun orbited the earth. It's wrong. It wasn't true. But it was reasonable and it was rational based on the information at, available at the time. Interestingly, that changed when new facts were presented, when new facts were discovered. We discovered that the old model was inconsistent with the new information. And that's when the position became irrational, unreasonable to continue to hold. The internally consistent model of geocentrism, which is basically what we're talking about, where the Earth is the center of the universe, or the Earth is the center of the solar system, became unreasonable, became irrational when the facts of reality proved to be inconsistent with that model. This is where we get to magical thinking. What if the proposition isn't falsifiable? Well, then it's ultimately untestable. And if it's not testable, an, an untestable, unfalsifiable position cannot result in a rational position. If you can't test it, its consistency with, rea with reality isn't accessible at all. Christianity includes a number of specific claims that do not conform to reality in any identifiable, verifiable, testable, falsifiable way. And the foundations of the religion, uh, the very core of the religion, are rooted in the supernatural. In addition to raw supernatural claims that would have to be beyond the universe, we have events that are purported to take place within the universe, things that have supposedly occurred and were observed that are inconsistent with natural law. The sun stood still in the sky, supposedly. The whole earth was covered with water. One man and one woman were formed out of dirt and are the origin of all of us. Donkeys and snakes and burning bushes all spoke. People claim to know or see the future, yet are no more able to prove it than someone on the psychic friend's fraudulent network. 
for entertainment purposes only there. At least they label that. For some reason, we don't label these other things as for entertainment purposes, even though they have no more support for the claim. Blood magic, flawed understandings of genetics and sheep breeding and about whether or not you beat them with a stick and and they turn out differently or have them stare at a spotted stick to have them turn out differently has nothing to do with genetics. Beyond the space and time, there's also stuff in space and time. A, a being that is supposed to be beyond space and time and also in space and time who created everything and loves everyone, but can only save us from what he's going to do to us by performing a weird blood ritual. And the claims that there are three beings as one being, which just violates logic from the get go. There are other claims that we used to consider magical and are now irrational. This notion that lightning comes from the gods. We eventually learned what lightning was. At, some, at no point was it truly rational to believe that gods were hurling lightning bolts, but it was the best explanation that people had at the time. But it wasn't rational, and it turns out it wasn't true. The earth spins on its axis. That is counterintuitive and bizarre, and yet it is true and proved to be true. We know that the earth isn't flat, and someone could say, hey, how is it that the earth could be spinning on its axis and I don't fly off into space? And it's because of gravity, which is something that we didn't understand as well. None of the supernatural claims of Christianity have been demonstrated to be true. None have ever been demonstrated to be testable, falsifiable. None, none of them have ever dem been demonstrated that they actually occurred. And how can it then be rational to believe an explanation for something that we can't even verify happened? If I have a soul, for example, I would suggest that people spend more time trying to prove that I have a soul then trying to explain what a soul is or how it works or how to save it or if it needs to be saved. That's like skipping past our fairies real and talking about what fairies want, where they're hiding, how to make them happy, etc. Christianity, down to its core, is wholly incompatible with reality and therefore irrational, which is why there are so many unsubstantiated appeals to miracles and yet no demonstration that these miracles actually occur. I'm not even convinced that Christianity is internally consistent, but it's definitely not consistent with the, with the rationally demonstrated facts of reality. There was never any debate on, is lightning real? Just what is the explanation for lightning? And like everything else that we've discovered, it wasn't magic. It wasn't supernatural. It would be absurd to debate, is it rational to, to believe that lightning is a part of reality? Of course it is. It, it's observationally so. Or to debate, is lightning-ism rational? The only debate was on, is it rational to believe that lightning bolts are thrown by the gods? And the answer, as it is for Christianity and every other appeal to the untestable, unfalsifiable supernatural realm, is no. Is it rational to believe that there's a naturalistic explanation for lightning? That question is supported by evidence and understanding and deserves a yes. Christianity, whether it's true or not, isn't testable, isn't falsifiable, makes claims that aren't supported by evidence or verifiable observation, and therefore isn't rational. Moreover, as Christianity holds that there's a being, an agent, who is beyond nature and is capable of communicating with us and capable of explaining all of these claims in a way that would result in a justifiable, rational model, and yet this hasn't happened, that's one aspect of Christianity that, while not fully falsifiable, certainly would affirm that the default position of this is not true applies and continues to apply until that changes. The burden of proof for truth and for rationality exists, and neither has been met for Christianity. Thank you very much for that opening, Matt. And want to say, folks, if it's your first time here at Modern Day Debate and you haven't hit subscribe yet, do want to encourage you to hit that subscribe button as we have many more juicy debates coming up. And with that, we're going to jump into the open conversation. Thanks so much, Stuart and Matt. Thrilled to have you with us. Well, we didn't really decide how we were doing this. Um, I, I I have questions. I mean, we're not doing like a rebuttal period, but you said some things that I'm not sure are true, if you want to try to clarify those. Either way, I want to put you on the hot seat because I want to learn. Well, okay. I, I mean, you <laughs> but got you questions. Have, okay, I'll go first and, and then you, well, let's do that. Sure, I we'll go back and forth. That. All right, just just one question. Every single time we've talked about the supernatural and you picking apart scripture, you've always gone to the Old Testament examples. 
to Burning Bush, Talking Snake, Sun Standing Still. I don't want to, I mean, I don't want to sound like a liberal progressive Christian, but it's, it's always dealing with the New Testament and the historical documents and Jesus Christ himself to find out if Christianity is reliable. Now, yes, everything he really is about, he, he does take the Old Testament seriously, but that doesn't mean that some of those stories are not going to be metaphorical or, so how can you always go to the Old Testament? All right. Well, first of all, I start with the Old Testament because it's the one that has the most obvious glaring errors, um, the ones that are are contradicted by facts of reality. And until somebody says, hey, we're going to chuck out the entirety of the Old Testament, which, by the way, chucks out the origin of everything and original sin and the uh, commandments and every prophecy that Jesus supposedly pr- fulfilled. I don't know how you can chuck that out. But in the New Testament, um, the, the very notion of Jesus performing miracles that haven't been demonstrated, that can't be confirmed, all of those things are still supernatural as well. It's just that it's easier to talk about the sun standing still in the sky than it is to say that if I spit on the dirt and rub it on somebody's eye, it doesn't heal them. And we have no evidence that it's ever been done other than the story, which isn't evidence for a proposition. It's just a claim itself. Um, but there's plenty of things, that, you know, that, I mean, the entirety of of, of Revelation, uh, almost the entirety of it, I'm sure there are words that aren't, um, is bizarre. It almost wasn't even included in the doctrine. But the very notion that somebody uh, died and was resurrected, uh, which we have no empirical evidence for, it's just a story in the book, um, that's a supernatural claim that I would put in that list as well. And so you you have Revelation, obviously, apocalyptic genre. John was probably schizophrenic when he wrote it. Then you have... Josephus and so many others, obviously back then, it, it was taken for granted. There were many miracle preachers, rabbis out there who could do both teach and as well as do the miraculous. But then the Old Testament, no, I I strongly disagree with what you said about the Old Testament. Just because you would take something like the talking snake and some of those passages, not so literalistically, and just because I'm not a creationist and taking the earth as 6,000 years old— doesn't mean you would turn to Exodus chapter 20 and the Ten Commandments and say, now let's throw those out too, and those are metaphorical as well, because they're not written in that manner, right? Sure, but I didn't include the Ten Commandments in the list of supernatural things, although the notion that God led people by a pillar of fire by day, or a pillar of fire by night and a pillar of cloud of... uh, pillar smoke by day and pillar of fire by night, um, and led them to a place where he wrote commandments onto stone. Um, there's no evidence for that beyond the story, and all of that is supernatural. Are you saying that didn't happen? I am way quicker to accept Hammurabi's code or something like it, like the Ten Commandments, as being passed down through a certain people group and making it successfully to us, at least the trickle-down effect, than I am to say absolutely when Moses or whoever may have written Genesis somehow meant, Matt, you better take that as a python. Attacking Eve, Eve had some fig leaves on, literally she was naked and there was all these trees everywhere, but there was this one tree that she could not touch the apple of. Like like I, I see it, I bifurcate those two pretty strongly. And I don't think that's being inconsistent. Well, no matter. So, what we would need to, then is for you personally, what parts of the Old Testament um, do you think are actually literal? Did God speak from a burning bush? Did He, uh, hand, you know, uh, write the commandments onto stone? Um, did He was He a pillar of cloud and a pillar of fire? Um, you know, or is is all this just metaphor? Um, because the the foundational parts of Christianity are still supernatural in origin, even if you want to dismiss uh, as metaphor certain things in the Old Testament. You know, even when, like I said, even when we get to the New Testament, uh, the notion that somebody was resurrected is not verifiable and certainly supernatural. And that's the cornerstone of all of Christianity. If Christ be not raised on our hopes in vain. Exactly. Foolishness to the Greeks and to the Gentiles and the Jews I see, see I, I like that right there. I think that's, there's obviously a level of embarrassment there when it comes to, this is foolish. This is ridiculous. 
even the Christians are saying that. If they'd have been like, oh, this is this is very normal. You know, we knew God was going to come and send his son and he was going to die and be resurrected. No, they, they said from the very beginning, this is foolishness. This is lunacy. We can't believe that this is happening. And just because Hume, you know, talks about, uh, he really, I thought, intri- you, you tell me if I'm wrong, but I think a lot of that type of thinking comes directly from Hume. But it's still, why, why couldn't, just because it's not empirically verifiable, I mean, obviously no miracle can be tested in a science lab. So why can't, I'm, I'm missing the, the like, like, why can't that chasm be bridged in a way where certainly it's not going to be verifiable empirically? Strong empiricism, I, I, I don't buy into. And yet, why can't there be a, a one-off supernatural piece to it? Well, because we have no way of testing the supernatural. So what I didn't, I said, it may be true, but that doesn't mean it's rational. Rational is something for which we have evidence and is consistent with the world, not just a claim. So here's the, here's the bigger question. What evidence is God incapable of providing? In order to win everybody to himself? I mean, couldn't God just show up right now in the middle of this debate demonstrate conclusively to all of us that he is in fact God and that these stories are true and consistent with reality in a way where it's rational. No, because that would be coercion versus compelling. That's not coercion. That's how we've demonstrated every other claim. When somebody says, hey, this is the truth and you provide evidence for it, that's not coercion. That is the demonstration. That is what makes it rational. Why would God, why would it be the case that God providing evidence is somehow coercive? Well, why can't I just say, prove to me you're my friend right now? You can say that. You just did. Would you want to prove that to me? Why um, do you, I, why I is, don't know that I don't that know a, that I am your friend, but we could then, exactly. we could then decide. Let's, let's say you're a close buddy. Why what? in the world would I say, Matt, prove to me right now you're my friend? I mean, nothing about, like, give me $10 right now, and then I'll know you're my friend. And God's not going to play that kind of game, right? God doesn't it's even what? show up to, to entertain. You, you, you're, God is like, I've got a girlfriend who goes to another school and you don't know her. That's the level there. This isn't like, prove to me that you're a friend. I would be happy to have God demonstrate that he even exists, let alone whether he's a friend. To make an analogy like that, to say, hey, would you be willing to prove you're my friend? First of all, yes. Um, we can have a conversation about yeah. what what friends are and everything else. Um, I, what I asked was what 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 uh, evidence can God not provide? And you said that demonstrating the truth of His claims would be coercive. And I'm like, even if it were coercive, which I don't think it would be, the the question was, what evidence can God not provide? So you know exactly where I'm going. I'm guessing. I'm, I'm quoting Blaise Pascal when I say that, when he so clear, I mean, he talks, it talks about how God gives us just enough evidence to connect with our heads and our hearts in order for us to make a free decision rather than coercively just showing up and saying, you better believe in me. Here it is. No, no, I'm right here right now. Pascal. And secondly, but Matt, sec- secondly yeah. to that point, that's simply going to be a type of mental ascent that you're going to buy into. There's not going to be any type of trusting relationship simply by him proving himself to you right now by showing up right next to your chair. Just like in Matthew 28, so many of his disciples actually connected with him physically after he rose from the dead, and yet they stopped believing just a matter of probably weeks later. I mean, how do you know, how can you be so certain that if God shows up right here, right now, that supposedly just you saying, oh, there you are. Now I can go to heaven, right? No, that's not even in the ballpark of what I said. None, I, nothing I've said has anything to do with whether or not to go to heaven or whether or not there's a trusting relationship. I'm talking about whether or not Christianity is rational. It, saying that God won't provide evidence is just an admission that Christianity isn't rational. Rational versus true. See, I, those two things aren't the same. They're not the same, but... I I mean, can we please connect them at least? I don't know. Why can't God connect them? (laughs) I'm not the one who believes in something and then makes excuses for why God, who can supposedly do anything that is doable, can't come down and present evidence for the proposition. For every other claim in the world where we said, hey, is it rational? We go to the evidence. And you have a being who you think is real, who can provide evidence, but won't. 
to, to suggest that he's got a good reason not to is just an admission that this isn't rational, but God's got a good reason to keep it not rational. So what's your definition of evidence and how much do you want? Um, evidence are facts which are consistent with a testable hypothesis, not just facts that are consistent with a proposition because pointing to the dead body is consistent with the proposition that the butler did it. But the body is going to exist whether the butler did it or not. If your hypothesis is that the butler did it, you need something that actually connects those two things. At the end of the day, I don't know what would actually be convincing, but God certainly would. And what I've asked is, why can't God provide that? I mean, you you listed a bunch of things um, in your cum cumulative case. I'm sure we'll get to many of them at different times. Uh, throughout this. But all I'm saying is that in order for something to be rational, in the sense of consistent with the facts of the world, there needs to be evidence to support that proposition. Is it impossible for God to present evidence for the proposition that he exists? Yes. And I would and say, then it's irrational. Looking at inner, any worldview, it's going to take a mixture for me. What I would call, I guess our definitions of evidence, see, I, I would say there's the intellectual side, which I gave some in the reliability of the Gospels and the resurrection and his character and claims. But then I gave the experiential as well, which is love, justice, forgiveness is disappearing in our culture. Why, why did forgiveness come through Christians? And, and why can't we hold on to something like forgiveness? And it's because there's a growth of secularization in our culture. Yeah, and what happens there when secularization really grows, and I'm not saying it, by no means is, is Matt Dillahante slower at forgiving than Stuart Connectly. You may be way quicker at forgiving. But I'm saying on the whole, I mean, it makes it, it makes a big difference. Like if atheism is correct, then human practices of ethics, you know, will function more effectively if the general public remains in total obfuscated darkness about morality's mere human origins and sheer functional purposes like because the origins don't connect and so why are you making that type of leap in your worldview as well when there's no evidence of a connection let's let's be honest making what leap in, in a worldview because you completely misrepresented secular humanism and now you're suggesting that Christianity is better for society, but that's irrelevant to whether or not it's rational. I don't agree that it is, but that's irrelevant as to whether or not it's irrational. Well, see, I wrestled with that one before prepping that part. I said, oh, is this part of the rationality? And I think it is. And maybe you would say, no, that's more so connected to whether it's true or not. But I always look at if the experiential lines up with the intellectual, that's when you get rationality and reason. But it's not just some brain in a vat. And let's the just experiential is poisoned by your biases. So, for example, when you began listing stuff, you said that secular humanism lands on humanity is ultimately good. That is not at all what secular humanism lands on. It has nothing to do with it. Secular humanism in all three of the manifestos and in every version of the, the uh, secular ethics that I've advocated for that other organizations have put out isn't humans are ultimately good. Although I think that humans are generally better than some people might expect. It is, we live here and we have to solve problems and we have no one outside of us to reach to. We have no, we can't appeal to a God that we have no rational reason to think exists. We ha can't appeal to some sort of external, we are left to our own devices is what secular humanism says. And the, the things that are positive that you were pointing to are not functions of Christianity at all. Forgiveness, cooperation, uh, sympathy, none of those things are necessarily direct uh, products of Christianity exclusively. They are instead the result of properly applied game theory. The, the recognition of you and I have to cooperate to some extent and figuring out to what extent that is, that is the principle that we've learned through game theory. This notion of who's going to forgive faster, by the way, um, is irrelevant until you demonstrate that faster forgiveness is better. Maybe forgiveness isn't always the right conclusion, and maybe faster forgiveness isn't the right conclusion. So even in talking about something like forgiveness, you've set up a false dichotomy of maybe I'm faster, maybe you're faster, without ever demonstrating that faster is relevant to better. No, that's not my point. Because I agree with everything you just said right there, but totally not my point. My point is simply, going back to the Roman Empire, 
what we're talking about when it came to who Jesus was, what his environment was, how he made changes connected to the rationality, perhaps, of whether this guy was even God or what this movement looked like. My whole point was it was totally natural to have a slave, a mistress, and a wife for a male and do whatever you want in any orifice you want. It was totally natural. It would have been extremely unnatural for us to have said, hey, the races, they're all equal by no means whatsoever. And that's why you have so many philosophers writing about that. And so my whole point is not, yeah, I, I would agree with you. I, I think actually one point to Matt Delahante here, I think the church has done a horrible job with forgiveness at times in the past. Why is that? It's because they haven't called out justice first and penalizing the wrongdoer first. Instead, they just said, oh, grace, forgiveness. You, know, you got abused. Shut up. You know, just forgive him and come back into the church. No, that's horrible. That's awful. But my point is, where was this all traced from? historically speaking. And it came from the Judeo-Christian worldview. No, the Judeo-Christian worldview. I mean, you like it, it supports, as, as we've addressed in other debates, it supports slavery. It's not about equality. Um, but even if all of that were true, even if Christianity was this uh, wonderful package of um, do this, do that, that led us all to a better world, that doesn't make the belief rational with respect to the supernatural claims and the supernatural claims are at the core of it. If, if the purpose of life is to, um, and, and don't get me wrong, I'm not talking about works in the slightest. Um, but if the purpose of life is to, uh, worship, and if you are among one of the elect move on to a better afterlife, then now it's making a claim that is supernatural in origin. That has nothing to do with how we treat each other here, except with the notion that someone is going to potentially judge that. The part, the most important part, that someone is going to judge what you've done, and really not, you know, under most, under normative Christianity, it's not about how you behaved or what you did. It's about whether or not you're forgiven. Um, as long as that's the case. Well, I, I forgot where I was going at the start of that sentence, uh, which which is going to happen, probably going to happen more uh, as, I, as I get older. But none of that deals with whether or not it's rational. Something could be good and not rational. Something could be true and not rational. But at the end of the day, if you're going to talk about the ultimate goal being salvation, then talking about how we live this life and what better way there is to live this life is kind of secondary, but it still doesn't get to rationality. I mean, oh, I, I, I agree I, with most of that. I agree with that. But so would you say that all, all human knowing is built on believing? Well, knowledge is a subset of belief. Um, yeah, I, I don't I don't know how someone can know something that they don't believe. Um, and so generally, I mean, you've got like justified true belief is one of the definitions or one of the clarifications of knowledge. And so that makes knowledge a subset of belief. Is that what you're asking? I don't know if that's what you're asking. Yeah, it's the, it's the, well, it's what I was getting at just a second ago with my point on, you know, I could ask you something like, do you believe that all of humanity at all times, so in all places no. are worthy of provision and protection? And so you might just know that. Okay. But what's the belief structure underneath it? Why, why do you know that? Why are yeah. you so certain of that? You shouldn't yeah. be so certain of it. Maybe I shouldn't be so certain of it. I, I'm, not so I'm not absolutely belief. certain of anything. Um, so that's for good me, to, that's good to hear. Right? We're, we're similar to nothing. Well, I mean, I, I, I think that's an undeniable truth is that absolute certainty isn't attainable because you can't have a conclusion that is more accurate than the method you use to reach it. And since we cannot absolutely affirm the foundations of reason we just pragmatically assume them and they continue to demonstrate reliability this is why i talk about maximal certainty as opposed to absolute certainty because it, it kind of gets in the way but when you're asking what beliefs is it based are, are is this knowledge based on if someone makes a claim where we we go through a heuristic most of us um 
to say, do I already believe this? Do Is this consistent with my understanding of the world? This is where all of our biases come into play. And one of the things that we're trying to do is to make sure that we train our gut um, so that we don't have to sit down and have, I don't know, an introspective jam session and, and accumulate a t- truckload of evidence for anything and everything because we'd never get anything done. And so instead, we say today is pretty much the same as yesterday. Um, tomorrow is probably going to be pretty much the same as, as today. We don't think that, you know, the moon is going to disappear tomorrow um, or that it's going to stand still in the sky or that the sun will do that or any of these things. Um, we we don't assume that those things are going to happen. But if they did, what we would then need is specific evidence that provides some sort of edifying understanding of how and why that happened. And I will always struggle with, say, I respect a lot of your thoughts right there and most of your thinking, but I will never, I might go to my grave scratching my head on what in the world Matt Delahante means when he talks about so many of the nuances. I wonder if he's making the majority of them up in his mind of evidence. And when he frequently says, I don't know what evidence I want. No, no, no. On this thing. About, there's on, not on enough claim, evidence. I, I don't know how I don't scratch my head over that. I, I mean, it's really, it's well, really easy. You, know, you it's, so it's, frequently it's, talk about the inconsistency, whether it's in scripture, maybe, maybe it's the gospels, it, the inconsistency of God's character you talk a lot about. But I mean, like, okay, what level of consistency do you want? Like, do you want the level of consistency to the point of collusion? Like, clearly these these authors, like, like knew each other perfectly and everything was consistent. But, but wait, now they obviously were playing off each other and we don't know that's how reality works i mean and with god the consistency matter is he's loving and wrathful and i know matt delante does not like the wrathful side of god but in order to love somebody oftentimes you do need to have a type of wrath in order to go after something that perhaps is harming them and that's what we see over and over again with god see if you just take a god of love then he can easily become apathetic in the face of true wrongdoing. And so that's why you have a nuanced understanding of God with many different attributes that looks inconsistent, but couldn't be any more consistent. Yeah. So uh, I'm not, it doesn't, I don't know what you mean by it bothers me that God is inconsistent. I'm, I don't think there is a God. I'm pointing out the inconsistencies within Christianity and it's, you know, portrayal of, of this God character. Um, when I go through, for example, the list of things that you said in your opening, um, I don't know that any of them address whether or not Christianity is rational. Um, what would be something? Evidence. What would be evidence? Well, God could come down here and present that evidence, but I asked you why. what, what evidence so God So we shouldn't can't be present. having this discussion or debate then, because I can't get God down here. Yeah, yeah that's not my fault. It's not my problem that you are advocating that something is rational when it's not rational. But then why are you having this discussion debate right now? I'm doing it to expose the fact that you think something is rational when it is not in order to teach people. You're the one who ha- who's saying Christianity is rational, and yet everything that would demonstrate its rationality, you don't, you don't allow for. You don't, it's not necessary. No, I, I cannot get on board with that type of strong empiricism and that type of, for me, playing God, where I'm going to twist God's arm. If there is a God of the universe, like, like, I honestly think you keep defining God as like this little pygmy creature who literally I can go out and just bully around myself. But if you define God as the creator of the entire cosmos, I mean, I mean, isn't that a little bit strong in your own standards, perhaps? That God's a coward. Why isn't he showing up? Exactly. So here's the emotional bias right there. No, why it's are you not an emotional God, bias. You know, the emotional, why are you the, angry the to God that you here, know does not exist? The emotional, the emotional, the emotional, the emotional here is the frustration of saying, you, you are holding a position that those of us who don't believe in this fairy tale are irrational. But the fairy tale is irrational because it isn't considered consistent with reality and it isn't supported by evidence. And then you're like, okay, what evidence would you like? Well, if you make a specific testable claim then we can tell what sort of evidence we would like. I would like for God to demonstrate that he actually exists. That wouldn't, by the way, be coercive. It wouldn't require me to worship or adhere 
Um, if I, I, there are plenty of people who exist, who have power over me, whose character I don't respect at all. And the character, most of the character that is presented in the Bible is somebody that I wouldn't respect or worship. As a matter of fact, I'm already on record as saying I wouldn't worship anyone ever because I think that those, those that would expect or demand worship are already undeserving of it. I, I have no problem at all respecting um, people or a God, provided that it demonstrates that it's deserving of respect. But to say this God existed, created you, and isn't going to provide you any evidence automatically puts him in the category where he doesn't deserve respect because he's not making a claim or the claim that's being made around him. He could demonstrate it instantly to be rational and reasonable, and he doesn't. Well, and so here's the problem. It comes dovetailing that you, you, we clearly get that human beings are naturally religious in some kind of way. Like culture always comes with religion on its heel. Paraha. Religion is leading. Not the Paraha. Sort of, what's that? Not the Paraha. Well, okay, I'll grant you the Paraha, maybe. I need you to explain that a little bit more later. But it, it, I mean, it, it's so in, endemic to the human condition, even though individual humans obviously like yourself, reject religious beliefs all the time. And some societies have been known, like Sweden, to reject kind of the religiosity. But still, humans naturally ask the questions over 87% of the world, over and over again, and they harbor these desires that religious beliefs fulfill. So what I was trying to get at is things like ultimate meaning, final hope, ecstasy, stable identity, Stable sense of self, strong reason for justice, rights and wrongs. And I think those all connect beautifully and, and are, show a tremendous level of rationality with Christianity. And you could be like, well, it could, that could be the case with other religions, too. What is your yeah. point? Yep. My point simply is there appears like the strong atheist philosopher Stanley Howard was lost talks about. There appears to be something incredibly missing from the secular worldview. No type of so, imminent frame that you live in that even, in no way it's called, it's like the buffered self philosophically speaking where where you don't allow everything that's closing pushing in on Matt Dillahante to say hey look love is immaterial hey look sacrifice all these hey where have I said any of this when you are dying why, why on earth are you trying to put words in my mouth and positions that I've never advocated for and the and the name isn't Dillahante it's e, but <laughs> my bad, my bad. So I was calling Aaron Raw Aaron for about a year and a half. Yeah. He didn't correct me once. I felt really bad. I, I, I tend to correct people on that. Here, here's the thing: um, the notion that human beings have desires for things that are tied up in religion ha, in, in no way demonstrates that those desires are tied to something real and true. That um, at least for all of the religions other than the one you've adopted. Somebody invented that and got it wrong. Um, but the fact that human beings tend to try to explain the unknown and can get it wrong and can be irrational is all anyone needs to explain everything about every religion, especially when we have zero supportive evidence for it. We don't even have a testable hypothesis. So Christianity isn't doesn't come with a testable falsifiable hypothesis, which by definition means it cannot have evidence for it. It can have facts that are consistent with it, but that's not surprising because the whole purpose is to try to explain facts that are unknown. But to, to have evidence for means that there is a, a, a link between the proposed explanation for a fact and the fact itself. This is how when we find out anything else, oh, What's lightning? Well, we don't know. We don't know anything. How come I don't fly off when the earth spins? I don't know. I don't know. Because we didn't know about gravity. The evidence ultimately builds a case for, ah, here it is. It operates according to, you know, the, the inverse square law with, of, of masses. Um, this is about what people do doesn't in any way mean that people are being rational or that what they ultimately decide or believe in is rational. That's determined by the supportive evidence for it. Okay, you keep going back to the lightning. Scientifically speaking, I mean, those who created science, at least modern day science, I won't go back to the Egyptians, 
Newton, Kepler, Galileo, they all, C.S. Lewis, later on, obviously not a scientist, but he references them frequently in talking about how they knew there was a lawgiver, they knew there was a creative mind, creator, and so they could get in touch with this lawgiver, and that there was a creative mind behind the universe, and so that they could find out what these laws really were, whether it's gravity, or for others, it was moral, it was a moral argument, moral absolutes. And so you keep defining kind of this God of the gaps, which is in, in no, in no, in no way what I espouse. But again, I mean, I used to think that you were a, early on when you first debated my dad. I thought you were a professor at Texas State, and I was there a couple months ago, and um, this is one that I brought up in my intro at the end. I know you're not, you don't like the experiential side of my rationality of Christianity, but value. Uh, 10 students approached me after I was done one day speaking and they started talking about the value of human life. And I said, okay, well, here's, here's, I'm a rational Christian, I believe. And here's where I believe I get my value as a human being. And after I went, they talked about theirs and I, and I pushed them on. I said, okay, so you believe you're valuable because you give yourself value. And they said, yeah. And I said, well, what if you're depressed? Like, what, what if you're manically depressed and you want to kill yourself? Well, I, I still have value. No, no, you don't. You said you give yourself value. And then another guy said, yeah, yeah, that's kind of right. I, I, don't, I don't really like that. I was like, yeah, okay, well, where do you get your value from? He said, well, I don't have any value yet. I was like, well, why, are, why do you have a smirk on your face? You have no value. You, you, should, you should be over in a ditch somewhere. And he said, well, well I, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get value after I make my first solid paycheck after college. That's my value right there. And so the rationality of Christianity, yet again, you have from the very beginning that what changed the Roman Empire was Jesus Christ comes, points to Genesis, and says, this is what's going to change the world right now. Knowing that the God of the universe says that Matt Stewart has value no matter what they think of themselves, no matter whether they knock it out of the park or not financially, no matter what they look like, no matter what, if they're handicapped or, or what, you have value no matter what. And that obviously changed slaves view of themselves. It changed the caste system. It changed everything dramatically. And so the value that we experience, another immaterial that's connected directly to the Christian faith, which I believe is part of the reasonableness, the rationality of Christianity. I mean, another big one is, you know, you keep attacking the supernatural and miracles. I mean, if you were teaching at Texas State and you had a couple Africans come over here, wouldn't it be, let's just say it would be the secular person professor who would be very militant and ostracizing them if you sat them down and said, we don't believe in the miraculous or the supernatural here. And the Christian, I'm sitting there, I'm saying, no, we believe in the miraculous and the supernatural. And here's actually how you as Africans can even grow, if you want to fit this on precise, in understanding the gospel when it comes to where does your value come from and these other things, but we're not going to suppress the supernatural miraculous when it comes to you. And so the piece of the supernatural as well as value, yet again, it's pushing in on you. It's pushing in on you in a way where you have to start asking the questions of, okay, does this make, is this part of my sense experience? And don't tell me it's not an important question because the majority of strong atheists who I respect the most when they were passing away, this is what led them to faith in Christ. It was these issues. It wasn't, Oh wow. That last point by Richard Bauckham on the resurrection. That was fantastic. I believe Christianity is rational now. No, it was the immaterial. It was these things that were pressing in on them that they could not explain from an atheistic perspective. Okay. So, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll try to do this as kindly as possible. First of all, no, telling no, someone that I don't believe in the supernatural is not being a secular militant. Uh, it's embarrassingly bad that you decided to pull in Africans out of the blue and then suggest that I would be a militant and, and somehow problematic by telling them that I don't believe in the supernatural. Even, even if I was a professor at Texas state, um, I could be a professor anywhere or not anywhere, and what my point would remain the same, which is 
there's no good reason to believe that the supernatural is real. There isn't evidence supporting the proposition that it's real. What people believe has no impact on what's true or rational. And this thing that you keep wanting to dismiss is value. You try to put words into my mouth. Um, I value many of the things that you talked about, and I could make a list of them, including love and freedom and cooperation and equality and all of these Fine. things. And it doesn't matter why right now, let me finish my thought, because irrespective of whether or not I have a good reason for believing those things, that has no bearing on whether or not Christianity is rational, which is the point of the debate tonight. If you wanted to debate, does Matt have a foundation for his values? That would be a different debate. But whether I do or not is completely irrelevant to whether or not Christianity is rational. Sure. I, I mean, again, these things in my mind are connected in the sense of like you skirted around my question of, do you believe that all people at all times are worthy of preservation? No, I answered it immediately. And, and protection. As soon as you said, do you believe all people at all times? I said, no, because I don't think that there are universals that apply to all people at all times. When you finished your thought, which is, do you believe all people at all times deserve, I don't know, protection or value or whatever else? We didn't continue that discussion because you went off in a different direction. But let's go back. It, no, because I don't want to go in areas that are too off topic. Go back to what you, where you wanted to go, because we don't have to stay here on this one. Let's move. Well, there were a number of things that, that you said when you were like assessing. Uh, you started with the, the claims in the character. Um, did Jesus craft a scourge and go chasing the moneylenders out of the temple? That scourge was definitely not metal rods that so many people think it was i, I, I didn't, I didn't speaking, say anything about what it was i said did he do it yes absolutely so so when you said that he wasn't angry there's an exception to that where he was angry that way and and potentially um it went on. handcrafted a scourge of whips to chase them out of the temple he also when he was, you know, in the Old Testament, sorry that the Old, Old Testament inconveniences you, but flooded sorry, the whole world, yeah. right? And didn't he kill the firstborn baby of everyone that didn't mark their door? Didn't he destroy the Tower of Babel where people were just trying to get together and cooperate? And he said, no, 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 this won't do. And then in, and frustrated their languages. Doesn't he sentence everyone to hell by default? You missed a key verse right there in Genesis 11. Everyone was trying to make a name to themselves. They weren't just hanging around trying to cooperate. They're making a name. No, no, no. What it if says it said is, they were just hanging around being good people trying to cooperate, then yes. It I says, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, oh. lest we disperse face all over the face of the earth. Name what is wrong? Ourselves. What is wrong with people working together and building a name for themselves as look at this wonderful city that we put together? What's wrong with that? The definition when it comes to in Hebrew, building a name for yourself was meant to be self-idolatry. It was not here. Let's put Matt's uh, plaque up on a nice school that he donated to. I, I'm, I'm still wondering what's wrong with it. What's wrong? Because, because all that comes with it. Everything about me. Just just think about it. The solipsism. The more I grow in my own personal ego and self focus, I guarantee you, a lot of wickedness comes with that. It's that's, solipsism that's and that has it's imaginable. solipsism, not solipsism, and it has nothing to do with ego and focus. Solipsism is about whether or not you are the only individual in the world, whether or not you can demonstrate that the out external world is real. How dare you correct my pronunciation of your I, last well, name? You did it, I waited and for now a long time to do it with the name, but it wasn't just the pronunciation that I corrected. It's what it actually means. Solipsism has nothing to do with ego. What's the definition? It, philosophically, solipsism is the is the question of the issue of the study of whether or not we have reason to to warrant believing in an external world. Can we demonstrate that the external world is real? Are you being fed a reality? Solipsism, there... the quality of being very self centered or selfish. Sorry, sorry, professor. <laughs> uh, yes, I was going with philosophy. And not the colloquial usage. <laughs> Philosophy is the viewer theory that the self is all that can be known to exist. Colloquially, people will use solipsism from their misunderstanding of the philosophical to talk about selfishness. But I never do secondary uh, 
definitions. I go with, with the primary one: the quality yeah. of being very self-centered or selfish. Self-aggrandizing authorities they describe usage, and I was going with the philosophical usage. And when you Google solipsism, it literally says philosophy right there to point out that this isn't a secondary definition. It is an alternate usage. I thought we were speaking in terms of philosophy, but fine, go with it. It as, just as teaches either. you not to question me in the area of vocabulary, which is the one area I did well in, in the SAT. So cool. just, just never again. So it's, so, I, I will, so, I will bank that away to not do. <laughs> so I don't know where we are. I think the money changers again, I, I think in John chapter two, it's, it's a crucial one. And I would say it happened probably twice to try and get out from underneath the contradiction. I, I would say that it shows his incredible devotion to his father and his love for his father. And that's connected to humanity as well. Otherwise he wouldn't have come down here and then connected to his, his wrath and holiness and desiring his people and his father to be set apart from those who are making idols within the temple. So I don't, I, again, it, making that, that idols within the temple. Okay. I, I, so the, like, the, like, do you agree with me it, just as a cultural study? I, I don't want to name any specific organizations, but in our culture today, people talk about justice, but it's vengeance really that they want. I, I see so oh, I think I, I would agree with you that I think more people ha have a have a flawed concept of justice and their flaw their concept is more about vengeance. Exactly. And so that's part of the reason why I, I think Jesus there and in so many other areas, he doesn't just let injustice is, just, is, just go and say, hey, hell, it's great. let's just forgive each other. Is hell he's justice? Saying, you gotta forgive. Is like, hell for, justice Matt has or to vengeance? forgive before seeking justice you have to forgive before seeking justice or it's vengeance yeah so is hell justice or vengeance luke chapter 12 i think it's 46 through 48 talks about those who will be met with many blows and those who will be met with few blows and then you got luke 16 with father abraham there and the rich man then lazarus and i think so clearly it's not jesus casting us into the lake of fire. So clearly there, the rich man does not have a name. His identity is idol, back to idol, is money. It's the whole idea of born a man, dine a doctor. He wants to live in hell despite being so miserable. And I think that's that's brilliant, by the way. That's, that's poetic. I don't know how and then I think in Luke chapter 12, the many blows, very few blows would be those who actually have more evidence more evidence would be met with more blows if they reject Christ. But if they if they accept and they have barely any evidence, that's few blows. And it's not talking about you as a, a punching bag. It's talking about the, the judgment day. And again, that gets connected exactly to our conversation right now. But the rationality of Christianity, I bet you desperately, you may not want there to be eternal life. Maybe, maybe you're set after live long Matt, hopefully, and prosper to 80, 85, 90, 95. Maybe you're good after that. I want to keep living in loving relationships. I think we were created for love. I think, again, Christian rationality, I think it makes sense. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit loving each other throughout time. We were created for love. What worldview makes the most sense in terms of what human beings were really created for? And I think it's Christian rationality from something like the Trinity. Yeah, but what I asked was, is hell justice or vengeance? It's justice. So, and that's why I gave the answer I gave. Well, I I, I asked a question because I I had follow up stuff addressing things that you, you had, and I wasn't necessarily expecting a sermon. So I didn't um, want you to get to those follow ups. Yeah, I, I, I suspect. But if if a child dies and and goes to hell for original sin, is original sin just? It's not going to hell. When David talks about in Psalms how he and Bathsheba's child dies based off of God's punishment. That seems pretty brutal, but he says, I will go to him and he will not come to me. They're going to be in, in, in heaven. Yeah. If you want to get into the age of accountability, we can. So but, in any case, but wait, I don't want to let you off the hook. Where? You would ask me a question. I don't mean to give you a sermon, but you would ask me a question. Let me just finish this one final point and then you go. Oh boy. 
You may not want eternity, r- relationships forever, physical. I want reality. But you I want don't whatever want, is true. So, so do I, I want to I, know I, as many true things and as few false things as possible. What I desire, what fantasy you desire is irrelevant to what is true and it is irrelevant to what is rational. Yeah, well, your reality, though, is a tough reality. Not My only reality it, is the same as yours. It, it, it makes me nervous. No, no, it's not. Our realities are very different because I believe I'm a magi- I mean, I believe in magical thinking. So our, there's no way our realities are the same. Our realities are the same. Your you perception desire- of reality and your delusions about reality aren't the same. But n- the person who's locked up in an asylum with, in, a, in a rubber room shares the same reality with me. That's just their perception of reality is flawed. Sure. Okay. Sure. Totally agree. I was just going to say, and finishing on the justice and wrath, I think you desperately want there to be a judgment day, even if you think it's a ridiculous idea. But there are so many people who are going to be ripped off. I mean, I counsel women all the time who are going through five, six, seven corrective surgeries from what their husbands have done to them. And then their husbands just take off and sleep with other women and get off totally scot-free. That sort of thing, if you don't at least want and look at hopefully the evidence for something like a judgment day, that's where talk about justice and vengeance when it comes to hell. That is justice. And you and I desperately want that. And our culture is all about justice, supposedly. And yet how funny it is that they think we need to get justice here and now and that, how that leads to vengeance. And all studies show that that just breeds more violence as opposed to the Yale theologian who lived in the Balkans, for example, Miroslav Volf, who talked about the most peaceful countries are those that believe in eternal judgment day where they don't have to get retribution here themselves on somebody else's dad who killed my dad. Yeah, I came here to debate whether or not Christianity was rational. I don't care what you suspect my inner thoughts and inner demons and inner desires are because all of those, first of all, you're wrong. And all you're doing is projecting your suspicion and your misunderstandings about my view on rationality. But all of that is irrelevant to whether or not Christianity is rational. I could be batshit crazy and desire X, Y, and Z, and it wouldn't have any impact on the topic of the debate, which is why I'm concerned that in every time I start asking a question that's supposed to lead to some recognition about whether or not Christianity is rational, I get a sermon, a pronouncement about what you suspect that I want, all of which is irrelevant. So when you, you just said don't that, like, though, when, when you what's you that? asked me that question, I'm I, not asked you, I asked you, I asked you a asked question, question on that hell. could have had a one word answer well, I didn't because want I was word. leading to other questions. I love hell. I wanted to talk about it more. Proceed. So you said that when you were assessing Jesus's character, one of the things is, is that he forgave sins. Yes. Prove it. Prove what? Prove that Jesus forgave sins. Prove that there's that there's sin and that there's forgiveness and that Jesus achieved it. Wait, wait. So, so there's two different questions there then. Is he himself, like, taking sin on himself? Are you talking about, like, a deep theological Christocentricity on the cross? Or are you talking about just, like, a germane, like, I forgive you and how he was forgiving people of their sins? You said, thing? you said Jesus forgave sins. I'm yeah. aware that that is a claim. I'm asking you to demonstrate with evidence that the claim Jesus forgave sins is true. So nowhere in my notes did I say Jesus forgave sins. In my notes, I have what I said is Jesus taught his disciples to turn the other cheek and to forgive 70 times seven. I I think that if you go back and rewind, you will find that you uttered the words, which I typed in immediately and and put this question in my notes as soon as it was said, when you said, G, when you were talking about the uniqueness of Jesus's character, and among the very many things that he supposedly did, you said, received worship, forgave sins, and you said them in that order. Oh, yes. In that context. Absolutely. Totally right. So when he's on the cross and he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. That would be an example. Uh, of what? How is that an example of forgiving a sin? He and the Father are one, and so he's forgiving the wrongdoers who put him on the cross. And he's actually reserved fully his power to call down 12 legions of angels to kill his wrongdoers. And Harry Potter casts spells. That's a non sequitur. (laughs) Yes, as is... You don't get to just assume that he and the father are one and that he forgave sins merely because there's a report that it happened. You have to actually provide evidence to show that this happened and it resulted in the forgiveness of a sin. 
Yeah. And the evidence is the historical reliability of the Gospels and the footnotes the that we historical did reliability of the, of the anonymous book within those Gospels. For which you have no originals. Aaron which- asked me that same question, and a handful of you atheists have. Why are you guys so focused on that question? Uh, on what question? The one you just asked. Did he prove that he forgave sins? Yeah. I only asked it because you claimed it. And and my my thinking here is if you're going to make claims, I would like you to demonstrate that they're true. And I have a I have a bunch of I have loads of notes. Um that was just, you know, after Jesus claimed to be God, okay, that's a claim. That's I have no objection to that. He could claim to be God. Hell, I could claim to be God. And then you said received worship. I don't have any objection to that because clearly people worshiped him. But then you got to forgave sins. That is now a positive claim of something that is both foundational to the doctrine and which you are asserting is true when from my perspective the only thing that has happened is that there's a claim that someone forgave sins not actually a demonstration that someone forgave sins what what you and i'm not saying this to pick on you but you and believers including myself when i believed often do is because you believe it you start taking the claims that are in the book and presenting them as if they are real and true but you don't have evidence that they are real and true. Yeah, so your your dichotomy between claims and evidence, you're going to have to walk me through that because I, I you brought that up last time, and that's very ambiguous for me. But demonstrate how do you how would you like me to demonstrate that Jesus forgives sins? I, I don't know how you would demonstrate it, but don't don't just raise your eyebrows and think that you get you got a gotcha. I don't have to know what you do to demonstrate the truth of it until you present the claim and the claim has to be testable and falsifiable. And then we can construct, okay, what would prove it? But what's funny is you, you and many other Christians and some of the people in the chat, I'm sure are are doing it are like, ah, Matt won't tell us what evidence he needs. I'm not the one making a claim. The sort of evidence, the quality and quantity of evidence that is needed is based entirely on the nature of the claim. And if you have an untestable, unfalsifiable claim, a nonspecific claim, I can't give you the evidence. But the issue here is you believe it happened, which means you have somehow reached the conclusion that it happened. And all we're really asking for is what evidence convinced you and do you think that evidence should convince others? Because that's how we go about determining whether or not your beliefs are rational. It, what is the evidence? It's when I say how, demonstrate the truth of this, and you're like, "Well, what would convince you?" I, I've tried answering that question. What convinced you? Because if what convinced you is a report in the Bible, that will never convince me. It is insufficient to the claim. So I almost ditched my faith my sophomore year of college, and it was largely because. A lot of my friends said they were picking on my Mormon friends, saying that they're all brainwashed. And so naturally, I said, hey, there's a chance I'm brainwashed. I mean, my dad's Cliff Connectly, I'm a pastor's kid. I, I, I grew up in the church. And so I think I got pretty far away. I think I got a healthy enough distance from the faith to be able to separate myself and be as unbiased as possible. And so for me, coming back to the faith and ultimately deciding, against hedonism and the bankruptcy behind it was what I've given you in terms of all of a sudden I saw all this evidence for the reliability actually of, you know, you look at something I didn't bring up, for example, six sources now for the resurrection having occurred. I mean, what did Matthew actually lean on? Six sources. And we take two sources for ancient history and say that that's pay dirt of something absolutely happening. Now, if you take away, no. obviously, if, if you remove that type of standard, then we're all of a sudden back to the Middle Ages. But it's six sources for the Christian faith. And so, you know, it started there. It, 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 it's multifaceted. It has to be. I don't think I could ever take just one. And so I started looking into this evidence. I started having a more vibrant devotional life. I had to, I, I can't just have a mental as- ascent. It, my faith involves mental, heart emotions through devotional life. And actually, if this God really exists, you're going to have to be able to have some ability to connect with him, like like via prayer or something. And then I've noticed it for me, it was by doing social justice work and how all three of those connected perfectly 
and said, wow, this, this makes sense. And no, I never bought into, I never went to the prayer groups where legs supposedly were growing back and amputees were now fully mobile. No, no, I, no, I, I, I didn't get there. But going back to the hard empiricism, I, I couldn't buy into that either. I, I mean, how can you test in a lab for a miracle? You can't. Yes, you can. It's outside of. So if I grow a finger name, back in a lab, a miracle. if I grow a finger back in a lab, you're going to tell, you're going to say that if there's a possibility to call it a miracle. No, no, no. You're going to say a medical this, miracle. This, no, no, maybe. no. This isn't about verifying whether or not the label miracle is justified. This is about verifying whether or not the event occurred. If we cut your finger off in a lab and we sit there and observe it and it grows back, we don't know how it grew back. We don't know if you have uh, the same sort of uh, genes that, let's say, a starfish have. We don't know any of those things. We don't get to call it a miracle in the sense of we have verified that something supernatural has occurred. We we don't get to do that. But what we do is we get to say, hey, we have an example where someone's finger was cut off and it grew back in front of us. And now we begin exploring to try to find what the best explanation is. We It may be that God did it. But until somebody demonstrates the link the evidence that links the regrowth of your finger with a God, you don't get to say that that is the the, the cause. This is all about connecting uh, observed facts with proposed explanations. And you have, as, as the observed facts here, you have a proposed explanation that there's a God, but you don't have the linking evidence that shows that that is in fact the cause. And And what's worse is that you can't even show the effect. You can't show a resurrection. You can't show a- any of the, the supernatural things that you, you can't cut off your finger and show that it comes out. You can't show someone getting crucified, being stuck in the ground for a day and a half, and then walking back out of it. None of those things have been demonstrated at all. So Christianity is in a position where it can't demonstrate an effect for, for actual observable effects and is proposing a cause for those. And you want to talk about the experiential evidence of what it's like to live as a Christian and how it impacts your life. That's fine, but you can do that with all of those things would be true about how it impacts your life, even if the the foundations of Christianity aren't true, because it's the belief portion that is relevant to changing your life. If you believe that there's a God that wants you to act in a certain way, and you do, it's your belief that is driving that act, not the truth of your belief. Sure. Sure. I, I, I'm not saying it proves Christianity okay. by no means. But if you look at your worldview and you trace it back to its roots, I mean, unless, unless you're not, there's many different types of atheism, whether it's the new atheist, scientism, secular humanism, different types of atheistic Buddhism, different forms of political theory. I, I think there's many different types, but if you all trace it all back, especially scientism, back to evolution, then obviously, no, the belief is tremendously important because the strong eat the weak. And I'm sorry if you're back to the handicapped person, you're a total drain on society. So no, the belief no, is not crucial. True. And like you said, Stephen no, I Hawking was not a total I drain on society. <laughs> That's right. It's true. Stephen Hawking was not a total drain on society. Oh, that's a one-off. Evolution a, is not survival of the fittest in the way that you want to define the fittest. You my have aunt, a fundamentally feet, flawed understanding. My of aunt evolution. six feet right now. But, from when you, me. but what's weird is you went to this and you're like, you, you started talking about my worldview. My worldview is irrelevant to whether or not Christianity is rational. Why can't you defend whether or not Christianity is rational without trying to attack what you suspect or want to pretend my worldview is? No, no, I don't know what your worldview. You kept saying secular humanism. And so I was I corrected you on secular off humanism that. because you're the one that brought it up. I haven't I didn't bring it up. I responded to you misrepresenting it. And on multiple occasions here, you've talked about what you think I want, my worldview, not all atheists are the same, all of this, all of that is irrelevant to whether or not Christianity is rational. Which any any time you raise anything other than here's what Christianity is and here's the evidence that shows that it's rational, you are deflecting and avoiding the topic of the debate. My worldview is irrelevant. Atheism is irrelevant. Secular humanism is irrelevant. Uh, Hinduism is irrelevant. Scientology is irrelevant. None of them are relevant to whether or not Christianity is rational. 
It's a big con. A couple things here. So you don't even think it's worthwhile to attack all the points I gave on the reliability of the Gospels or the supposed evidence for the resurrection because it's irrational and it's not evidence. Two, this link you kept making between God and what was going on in the scientific lab, I'm guessing yet again you're going to say, I don't know what that link would be at all. I don't know what to look for. So yet again, seriously, I, I want to be with you. and I don't mean to come off as sounding mean because I, I legitimately want to be with you when you say this, when you talk about this link and you talk about this evidence and you're doing a little bit of the goalpost moving, but I, I'm going to... I'm going to grant what you you're a good guy. Moved? I'm, a gra- I'm granting you a good guy. I, when you talk about evidence, it seems like you, to me, you move it almost every single time. No. This one gets back how, to the. How can you simultaneously. It's just so interesting to me. And then, si- and, and also simultaneously say that I don't have a standard of evidence. That's not goalpost moving. You're the one moving the goalposts here by suggesting that I have two minds about evolution. I will believe any claim that is supported by evidence. I defined rationality at the beginning of my um, opening with pointing out the philosophical construct of internal consistency and how it's insufficient, and that in order for us to say it's rational, it needs to be consistent with the facts of reality. Show me the facts of reality that confirm Christianity. That's, That's it. That's what I've said forever. I want to say, we'll give you a chance to respond, Stuart, but just in a few minutes, we'll be going to the Q&A. What I find so interesting, I just learned today, isn't relevant, 20th century, the the most, three most famous atheists of the 20th century, arguably, A.N. Wilson, Sartre, and Camus, all became Christians before they died. Didn't know that. Sartre was buddied up with a pastor who gave him all these reasons, all this evidence, Camus, it was a meaning thing. It was like, okay, there's ultimate meaning out there and purpose. And then Ian Wilson, it was a more, it was a moral argument. And um, I just bring that up because I find it to be so interesting that we can talk about our own definitions of evidence, our own definitions of what standards could look like in terms of what would convince me. We could talk about what is compelling versus coercive. We could talk about all these little things, and yet I think I saw little boy Matt came out, and little boy Stuart too, about five minutes ago, where all of a sudden the conversation just got so, like starkingly. Little boy Stuart's simple. in full effect right now. It got stark. It got starkingly simple, where all of a sudden you just said to me, "You're just like, just get him to just." Just jump out of the grave right now. I just want to, I, I just, that's all I, I want. Say that. Just right here, right now. You, you can't quick, even accurately say what I said when you're accusing me of being childish. A quick handshake, and we don't have to have any type of debate, discussion. We don't talk, talk about I'm the discussion. only one here debating. We don't talk about anything like that. It's just game over, that simple. So why don't we just leave it at that? Because I'm not the one who's here making a case that I can't make and then saying that someone's being a little boy. Grow up, Stuart. <laughs> if you don't find any anything, any of what I gave attractive, I haven't heard you say one thing in all of our debates, anything attractive about the Christian faith, not one. And we spent hours together, not one. If you're not going to grant a single thing attractive about the Christian worldview, Stuart, you will never be convinced. Correct. But Stuart... This debate isn't, is there something attractive within Christianity? If that was the debate proposed, I would have just said yes and ended it. The debate was, is Christianity rational? And once again, you have avoided that subject and deflected to something else, a personal attack on me and what I have or haven't done, and then an irrelevant thing about, do you find anything in Christianity appealing? Yes, I do, but that's not the debate. It's not relevant to the debate, and you are incapable, it seems, of actually staying with what's relevant to the debate. You talked about these atheists. Don't tell me this because the atheists that I respect all had deathbed conversions. Well, deathbed no, no, no. conversions no, no, no. You missed doesn't my point mean on that, that they're rational. You missed my point on that. I said we could quote all these guys all day long and change the definitions of evidence, and yet it's the little boy Matt and the little boy Stuart that are going to ultimately come back to squabbling over this little issue. And it's going to be a very simple thing. And that's just, Jesus, get up out of the grave, prove yourself to me right now with a handshake, and we'll call it a game. And that's it. And that's what it all boils down to. And I don't, look, I don't blame you for that. I don't, I don't think that's a bad thing. 
My Jewish friend, who I used to spend summers with, said the exact same thing. He said, look, sure, it's just, it's literally that simple. Just This isn't about, I, right I, I don't know how many other ways to say it. I'm so sorry, but what I believe isn't relevant to whether or not you can demonstrate that Christianity is rational, and you haven't, and you haven't come close, and you haven't attempted to, and instead, now you're devolving into, oh, little boy Matt came out and demanded Jesus get up. No, what I said no. is, present the evidence that supports your hypothesis, except you don't have a hypothesis because hypotheses need to be testable. So present the evidence that supports your proposition that there is in fact a God at the root of this. And I gave you my four points. You didn't like them. And so you took me on this merry-go-round of I took you on a merry-go-round. And you and I, I like, think if we rewind, you'll you find and I that like I sat here about... quietly and patiently while you delivered servants and deflected. I didn't take anybody on a merry-go-round. I still have tons of notes that I didn't even get to because every even a simple question of is it justice or vengeance led you into a three or four minute sermon so that I didn't get to get to the other points. This may be an opportunity to jump into the Q&A. Yeah, let's go to questions. Do want to remind you, folks. Yeah, as I mentioned earlier in the stream, our TikTok is linked at the top of the chat or at the top of the description box. We are about 60% of the way toward our goal of 1,000 followers on TikTok, which will unlock being able to live stream these debates, debates just like this with Stuart and Matt tonight on TikTok as well. We're pumped about that. So please do follow us over at TikTok so we can get over that threshold of 1,000 to unlock that feature. And with that, we're going to jump into the Q&A. So thanks so much for your question. Dark, Dark Binks 80, or Darth Binks 83 says, love these debates. Keep them up. Thanks for your support. Ozzy and Talk says, empathy and moral intuition is biological. This existed prior to Jesus. There were many philosophies that taught this prior to Jesus. Stuart. Yes, that's very true. Many of the teachings that set apart Christianity had to do with Turn the other cheek, love your enemies, forgive in perpetuity. You got it. This one coming in from. Do appreciate your question as well. Malavia says, James, you'll always be my favorite soy boy. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Here, Fishy Fishy says, Modern Day Debate. Thank you for all the content, James. This is my new favorite channel. Thanks for your support. Seriously, that means a ton. Says, and by the way, want to give you want to give all of the credit toward or to the guests as they are the lifeblood of the channel. So I want to say, folks, if you haven't yet. Check out Stuart and Matt are both linked in the description box right now. That includes if you're listening via the podcast as all of the modern day debate debates end up on the podcast and you can find both Stuart and Matt's links in the description box there too. So what are you waiting for? They also said also Alex Stein is the most, one of my favorite debaters. Appreciate it. Okay, good. The atheist Allosaur says, if we are all made in God's image, then why aren't we all invisible? Thanks for that. I don't know if that was serious. This one from Ryan C says, how does Matt know what rationality is? What is the empirical evidence for rationality? I'm certain he has never seen the number one, but nonetheless believes it exists. The number one is an abstract concept that we've defined. One isn't in and of itself rational. As I pointed out in the opening, um, what is rational is defined by that which is consistent with the facts of reality. You got it? This will come in. Coming in from, do appreciate it, Noah's Ark, Kansas says, what Christian society effectively transitioned or turned away from God, excluding physical conquest, and then ended up better in the long term? If so, better for who? I think they're saying, is there a society, Matt, that left Christianity, as a, generally speaking, and was better off, and then said, well, if it is better off, for who? Well, I, I don't know that I could name a society, but one of the problems is that we don't have a, for example, secular humanistic society um, at all. There are certainly atheistic societies, but none of that's relevant to the subject of the debate because whether or not Christianity has done things that are good for society wasn't the purpose, it wasn't the subject of the debate. So if your point is, hey, there are, there's nobody who left Christianity and got better for it, um, that's not relevant to the topic of the debate of whether or not it's rational um, at all. You got but it. To whatever extent that may or may not be true. Uh, well, I'll just leave it there. You got it. This one coming in from, do appreciate your question. 
H.G. says, Stuart, who determines what the canon of Scripture is, i.e. the 66 books in the Bible? Different church councils, and it was decided by how old it was, whether it was orthodox, and whether it was written by uh, eyewitnesses. You got it. Thank you very much for your question. This one from Samer. Thanks so much. Says, let's say God exists and created us. How do you cross from there to the, quote, he is therefore worthy of worship, unquote. Says, I love my parents, but I don't worship them, though they created me. Thanks, Stuart, Matt, and James. Well, that was a question for me? Yep. I can read it again if you like. Just read the end again. Uh, is it, it's just the question of why, why does God need worship? Yeah, I think they're saying like, hey, I love my parents. They created me, but I still don't worship them. Yeah. Well, so if you're a child and you have a stepmother and she works her fingers to the bone for 40 years, puts you through college, and you decide, I'm not going to thank her whatsoever. Well, that would be pretty pretty messed up. No, she, she's absolutely worthy of your thankfulness as well as worship. And if it's the God of the universe, then how much more so? Yeah, the problem is, is that I can demonstrate what my mom has or hasn't done. Nobody's demonstrated that God exists or has done anything at all. It's just an assertion that they want me to uh, worship and revere their uh, model of what what did or created this. Uh, until you demonstrate that, that God did this, you're just asking me to agree with your concept. You got it. This one coming in from, do appreciate your question, Shasta. Shasta X says, how is it possible that we have not moved to 2023? You got to update your clock, Shasta. HG, thanks so much, says uh, Stewart. Let's see, we got that one. Will Stewart says 365 or Matt, by the definition you gave, if God chose to sufficiently prove to man, A, that he exists and chose to not sufficiently prove to man, B, would it both be rational for man A and also irrational for man B at the same time. Yes. By, by definition, evidentiary warrant, like in the same way that if, if I know something that Stuart doesn't know, like I know what Arden said to me right before we went live from direct experience. Um, and actually, I, in, in response to one of his things about the rapid, no, nobody, he didn't do it quite this way, but nobody's people will frequently bring up that um, no paradigm shift has ever taken place that even begins to rival how rapidly and, and broadly Christianity spread. And I would say that uh, that's not true because QAnon and the notion that the, the election was fraudulent spread much wider, much quicker and had a broader impact in a, in a shorter period of time. But that was what Arden said. Now, I know that that's what Arden said to me, but Stuart doesn't. So my evidentiary warrant for accepting that this is what Arden said is different from whether or not Stewart's is. Does Stewart have a rational justification in believing that Arden actually said that? He may well, because he may find me generally trustworthy based on the other things that, you know, I, I haven't lied to him about what other people have said, even if we disagree on stuff. But my, irrespective of whether or not he is warranted and is rational in believing it, our foundation of what is rational is based on what evidence we actually have. So it is possible for a God to exist and choose to reveal himself to Stuart in a, in a way that Stuart can have evidentiary warrant and not reveal himself to me uh, so that I don't have evidentiary warrant. But if I were to believe in that circumstance, I would be behaving irrational, irrationally and my belief would be irrational. You got it. This one coming from Atheist Velociraptor says, for Stuart, why do you think less than 15% of academic philosophers lean toward theism while the majority are atheists, and then said, "This is from Phil Paper Survey of 2021." Yeah, it was that. It was under five percent thirty years ago. Now it's it's not fifteen percent. It's like twenty five percent. So it's religious professors actually they're decreasing. But how much was it? Five hundred decreasing greatly. You, you think it was more than five five or fifteen percent of uh, three hundred years ago? <laughs> three hundred. <laughs> Well, no you, idea. No you, somebody asked a completely irrelevant question, which is an argumentum ad populum, which you've already tried to use several times tonight. And then you argued that it's basically, oh, it's increasing. But what was it 300 years ago? Because if your argument is that there's a trend towards more and more philosophers accepting theism, um, that still is irrelevant to whether or not it's rational. 
And it's irrelevant, even more so, because if it turns out that it was 50%, dropped to five and went back to 15, the overall trend is still downwards. Who said it was supposed to be rational, though? <laughs> the whole debate is whether or not it's rational. No, but these questions, these questions can be totally off topic, and they typically are. Okay. This one coming in from, do appreciate your question. Samir Farsane says, I'm not Christian, but Christianity is rational because it doesn't claim this beautiful universe came from nothing. Atheism does, and that's irrational. Yeah, atheism doesn't make any claim about the origin of the universe. It says, I don't know how the universe started. There's nothing within atheism. Atheism is simply not accepting the theistic proposition. So you're wrong about whether or not atheism is rational or not, but the that doesn't make Christianity rational. Uh Say, saying you're you're beginning assertion that Christianity is rational rational because it doesn't declare that the universe came from nothing does not in fact make Christianity rational. That is a fallacious line of reasoning. So you're wrong at every conceivable point. So you're in good company though because Frank Turek is fractally wrong about pretty much everything he's ever posted. So you're right there with in good company. This one coming <laughs> in from do appreciate your question. Ozzy and Talks says, Stuart, if God thought I had value, then why would he ever reject me for not believing he exists, just like with your silly analogy with some kids? In no way does he reject you. If he's, if he tells a thief on a cross that you're going to be with me today in paradise, who was probably a murderer, I mean, that that's pretty accepting, is it not? And it, it, he leaves it up to your free decision. That, that's the ultimate celebration of one's free will to allow you to make your decision. He's not going to coerce you and pull you into heaven with them. So, so that's totally wrong. You got it. That's Thanks called a your... post hoc rationalization based on a story that you can't prove, but cool. Matt just, <laughs> Matt, I'm going to go. So I'm going to stop though. I had the sermons tonight. You get to go now in the Q and a, <laughs> this one from do appreciate it. Endo says, Stuart does Corinthians 13 verse 4 conflict with your definition of love needing wrath. If love needs wrath, where is God today with his wrath? For thank you for the debate. First print what what verse did she quote? 13:4 love is patient and kind. Correct. Oh. Where where is God today with his wrath? I think his wrath changed from the Old to the New Testament. It doesn't mean Jesus was any less of a God of wrath. I think it's more of an eternal approach now. Jesus fulfilled the law. The law had a lot to do with blessings and curses and God's wrath being meted out if if the Israelites disobeyed him. But now it's it's much more focused on in an, e an eternal kind of way and Judgment Day. And thank God, so much of the Psalms are praising God for Judgment Day because it's what Matt and I want desperately for those. No, who stop saying what I who've want. Been ripped off so badly in this life. I want them to get justice. I don't want so many of these people to get away with. There is no justice robbery. in your system. A mass murderer gets forgiven and goes to spend eternity in heaven while his victims go to hell. There is no guarantee of justice in your system that is grossly immoral in the New Testament is grossly worse than the Old Testament because at least then you died and slept with your fathers, but now you're going to be punished forever. <laughs> the notion that there's justice within Christianity is one of the most bizarre lies that people have bought. It's embarrassing. It's right up there with pretending that it doesn't allow for slavery. <laughs> this one coming in from do appreciate your question Sommer says matt won the pronunciation debate thanks Sommer. long nights youtube and says if i wrote a book that 40 that 40 authors added to it's then declared mostly false and easy to pick apart by the masses even by kids would you question it i think that's for you Stuart. i missed uh, yes that. yes i would question it this one came in from samir Thank you very much. Says we found a log cabin in newly discovered island. Would you say we discovered a wild house that grew by accident? No, because nothing comes from nothing. Is the burden of proving it was built contingent on finding on finding out who built it? Yeah, you see, here's the problem, Samir. Um, you called it a log cabin. A log cabin has a particular definition. We already know that log cabins are constructed and don't occur naturally. The recognition of design is not about complexity. It's about recognizing a contrast between that which occurs naturally and that which doesn't. If you come across a log cabin uh, on an island, what you've had to do is first verify that what you're looking at is a log cabin and not something that merely looks like a log cabin. And by the time you verify that it is in fact a log cabin as you assert, then you will know that it was, in fact, 
built by someone because that is where all of the available evidence points. You don't get to then look at all of reality and pretend that it is an obvious, verifiable creation by an agent because you have nothing to compare it to. You got it. Thank you very much for your question as well. Mark Reed says, Stuart, why would anyone be happy for a judgment day? Why do you seem so keen on the world ending? How is that rational? How is it rational for me to be keen on the world ending? No, I'm, I'm not saying I want judgment day to happen tomorrow. I just want it to happen at some point in the future. You got that's, it. That's my basic point. I, Yeah. Tim Zim. Lick, thank you very much, says regarding biblical criticism, the way atheists conceive of the God of love is faulty out of pleasure and comfort, not of love. I think that's for you, Matt. Is it? Can you do it again? Because I don't understand that. No problem. They said regarding Bible criticism, the way atheists conceive of the God of love is faulty. They require God to be a God of pleasure and comfort, not of love. That's a lie. I don't, I don't require any God to be a God of pleasure and comfort. I don't, I would say that for me, um, love is a label that we put on a wide uh, collection of psychological states within human beings. There's um, a, a friendship love, romantic love, all of these things. But in any case, all you're saying is that you care strongly for someone, that you value them, and that you are willing to do certain things for this individual that you wouldn't for another. Um, I don't have any expectation about if there's a God and he's he's a monster who doesn't love anybody, I'll still believe that he exists. I won't respect him and I won't share values with him. But whether or not a God exists is independent from whether or not it is a loving worship. So it's just absolutely dishonest to pretend that I am only willing to believe that God X exists if God X has love the way I prefer. I'm happy to believe that God X exists if God X is a terrible monster who doesn't love anyone, provided there's actual evidence for it, instead of trying to do what Stewart has done and psychoanalyze me in order to dismiss the fact that you don't have evidence to demonstrate that your beliefs are rational. Why not sit back and reflect a little bit on what it would take? Because I'm not denying the existence of a God because it doesn't love the way I think it should love. I'm addressing the claims of Christianity and pointing out the problems with them, both with regard to epistemic warrant and with regard to emotional and psychological evaluation. You got it. Thank you very much for your question. This one from Ozzy and Talk says, Stuart, is Matt's perception of reality more rational than a Hindu's? Why or why not? Um, his is less rational because at least a Hindu would believe in transcendent objective morality and at least well i would say in the face of suffering they're they're equally as rational because matt would not have an answer towards a dying cancer patient he would just bring hey look this 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 death is just stripping you of all meaning because there's no eternal life while the hindu would go to the dying cancer patient and say that you did something wrong and that's why you have cancer right now so the rationality piece in the face of evil and suffering i think for atheism and Hinduism is you, is equally difficult. Every time Stuart tells you what I would think or what I would say, he's probably wrong as he was just then. You got it. This one coming in from, do appreciate your question. Happy Dome says the truth about the rationality of atheism is that the absence of evidence is not the evidence of absence. This is an assumption. Agnosticism is more rational from a place of ignorance on the mystery of God. Yeah, so first of all, agnosticism isn't some middle ground between theism and atheism. It addresses a different question. Theism and atheism address a question of belief. Gnosticism and agnosticism address a question of knowledge. The tired old axiom of absence of evidence isn't evidence of, uh, of absence is wrong. It's correct in what it means when, for example, Carl Sagan used it, that the mere fact that you don't have evidence for something does not mean that that, that, that thing is false. But Absence of evidence where you would expect there to be evidence is, in fact, evidence of absence. It's not confirmation of absence. It is not, you can't falsify the unfalsifiable. But if you say that you just killed somebody and stuffed their body in your trunk, when we go out and open your trunk and we find no evidence to be consistent with that, it doesn't mean that you are wrong, but it is evidence against your claim. 
And so evidence of uh, absence of evidence is evidence for absence, but not confirmation of absence. You got it. Yeah, and thank you very much for your question. This one coming in from Hates Stairs says, describe the biblically accurate angel, Stuart. I'm not sure what they mean by that. Huh. What is the fallen angel? Satan. There's the angel Gabriel, who is gives tough messages. Um, I would read the book Angels by Angels and Demons by Heisler, but no, I don't I can't give you too much on that. I suspect that they and I'm just guessing. I'm suspecting they were looking for like physical attributes of, you know, how many eyes and wings and, you know, right, what right. are their capability sort of things. Just, this is this is kind of common. It's one of the reasons why I don't go to this stuff, because I don't I, I could have I'm on my list of things um, that aren't consistent with reality. I could have gone to angels. Um, but, you know, it's like you can keep listing stuff from the Bible. that's problematic. And but whether or not Stuart. I don't know, has a description of an angel isn't really relevant. You got it. This one coming in from, do appreciate it. Franco Trujillo says, face it, Matt. Stuart knows everything about you. Helpless, like a fish out of water. You've been outmatched. That's true. Hail our debate king, Stuart. <laughs> That's completely true. That That is ab- it's absolutely certain that, that Stuart knows me better than I know myself. It must be that God gave him this information. Um and that would then convince me that there is a God. You want to you want to demonstrate that there is a God? Ask your God what number I'm thinking of. Well, I'm actually a psychotherapist. That's why I know you so well. But head to toe. <laughs> you, you should yeah. refund your toe, degree Matt. because you do not know me as well as you suspect and would like to pretend. It's too easy. <laughs> this one coming in from, do appreciate it. Samir Farsane says, Matt, you seem to forget that religion is about belief not knowledge why would you be rewarded for knowing you have to seek god first not the other way around why and and i'm asking this and not i realize you're not gonna be able to respond but this is this is another um dodge um if if religion's about belief and about knowledge then i have zero interest in it because what i want is knowledge i'm happy to believe as many true things and as few false things as possible but uh, knowledge should be the goal, which is knowledge is in, in, in many different definitions. But the one that I tend to use is that knowledge is a belief held to such a high degree of confidence and warrant that it would be worldview altering to discover that it was wrong. But your claim is that it shouldn't be about knowledge. It shouldn't be about you know, evidentially warranted. It should be that you you should believe it because there's some virtue in faith. That's not true. Faith is the excuse people give when they believe things when they don't have a good reason. Faith is, faith is not a virtue. It is a vice because there's not a single position in the, in, in the universe that one could not accept merely on faith as a foundation. I'm going to take it on faith that white people are better than black people. I'm going to take it on faith that you know this is, this is more important than that. All of those are justified by faith. I want things that are justified by evidence because that is where the rational world is. Faith is irrationality. But you do have beliefs, right? I have loads of beliefs. Okay, so I'm just making sure I'm catching your, your difference between and the definitions of. Yeah, I, I have okay. belief is merely accepting a proposition as true or likely true. Knowledge is belief held to an incredible degree of certainty with warrant, whether it's justified true belief or whatever. I believe many, 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 many things um, because knowledge isn't always attainable, even though it should be desirable. What I'm not willing to do is believe things for which there isn't evidentiary warrant that demonstrates rationality and consistency with the facts of reality. You got it. This one coming in from Noah's Ark, Kansas. Says, do you have an example of the Big Bang or evolution? Is that from me? I think so. Okay. Um, I have an example of of the Big Bang, and that's the universe that you're sitting in. And the... The microwave, cosmic microwave background radiation, which is one of many evidentiary factors that demonstrate Big Bang cosmology, not as true, but as the current best supported scientific model. Science doesn't make proclamations about truth. What it does is it presents a model, a theory that is robust and testable and consistent with all the facts of reality. This is why rationality is so important. Big Bang cosmology could be wrong. As a matter of fact, I had a friend who up until his death was working on a, an alternate cosmology that, if true, would be would replace Big Bang cosmology. And so my worldview isn't contingent on whether or not the Big Bang is true 
or whether or not evolution is true, even though evolution is in fact true, evolution being the observation of the diversity of life, the theory of evolution by means of natural selection is merely the single most robust, consistent demonstration of a model that explains the observable fact. But at the end of the day, if Big Bang cosmology is wrong and evolution is wrong, that won't prove Christianity in the slightest. And most Christians recognize that their view of Christianity isn't necessarily in conflict with either Big Bang cosmology or evolution. Although some are in a position where they are really, really uh, opposed to this. And it's because of a fundamental misunderstanding of both metaphor and evolution and science. You but got it. none of that has anything to do with whether or not Christianity is rational, because I can be wrong about the Big Bang and evolution, and that still doesn't tell you whether or not Christianity is rational. You bet. Thanks for your question. Noah's Art Kansas also asked, can you be rational by comparison? I don't know what they mean by comparison. I think the closest I could get to that would be like relatively rational, like somebody's closer to being rational. Okay. Um, that makes sense. I think it's probably a discrete thing where um, you, you can certainly be further away from like the barrier, uh, but it's like, you know, if you got 50 point X percent uh, consistent with the facts, then you're rational. And at 49, you're not. And at 12, you're like a Republican. And at two, you're like a MAGA Republican. You got it. This one from Oliver Catwell. Thanks so much. Says, if the Bible were read as epistolary <coughs> fiction, does the reduction of divine smiting in the New Testament offer evidence of the forgiveness of sin in that context? I'm looking up what epistolary um, define epis. Epistemology is the method by which we determine what's reasonable. It's it's the only thing is it might have been a misspelling but it it's uh they put epistolary epistolary epistolary. Let me this is a brand new word. I've never seen this in my life. They it says wow. uh relating to the writing of letters. So maybe like the epistles like first oh, Corinthians, Romans. Epistolary. They say, if the Bible were read as an yeah. epistolary fiction, does the reduction of divine smiting in the New Testament, so they're saying like maybe a progression in the sense of, or at least it's got less smiting, say, does that offer evidence of the forgiveness of sin in that context? I don't know the epistolary fiction. I don't, I, I don't know that I understand it, but I'm I'm not sure that, so let, let, let me put my, here, let me put my Jesus hat back on. Keep it handy. Um, I don't think that the reduction of direct smiting in the New Testament is necessarily evidence of of, of, a, of forgiveness itself, but it seems to be evidence of some sort of shift in portrayal of the character of God from, from smiting to caring, which is why so many people have, have pointed out that there seems to be two separate characters um, that are identified as God, not, not necessarily actually, but like God softened or something, but I don't know. I think it was probably for Stuart anyway. Stuart, any thoughts? The only uh, thing, uh... Uh, God softening. I like that. I have a I, question. I was, I was distracted by the Jesus hat. I have a question. It looks, this, it's is a kind good of, one. this is kind of just for fun. And that is, Somebody sent me this Holy Spirit board where I can communicate directly with Jesus Christ. It's basically like a little Christian Ouija board with a cross planchette. Um, will it work? And is it sinful? <laughs> what do you think, Stuart? <laughs> Stuart, you're so entertained. <laughs> it's, it's not so oh, it's, uh, it's It's good to be with you boys and without the kids for a night, you know, getting out on the town here. <laughs> That's why I don't have kids. Actually, that's not, that's not why I don't have kids. I don't have kids because I couldn't have kids. But This one coming. Oh, actually, Oliver had another question, too. This is, Oliver also asked, for both, if God is omnipotent, can he exist for some and not for others? Would he hit the like button? How many times? Thanks, thanks both of you, for a great discussion. Thanks, Oliver. Uh, that's an interesting question. I've never heard that one before. So if God's omnipotent, could he exist for some and yet not for others? 
Is that like logically possible that if no. there were a God that's omnipotent, no. he could do that? God's existence is a discrete. God either exists or doesn't. It would be a violation of logic to su suggest that he both exists and doesn't exist uh, based on who, who we're talking about. What do you think, Stuart? They also asked, for, they said for both. It's, yeah, it, it definitely seemed to me like it was an illogical point. I, mean, I didn't think in any kind of way. The discreteness is a, it's obviously a big attribute that, the, 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 read it one more time though. They said, if God is truly omnipotent, could he exist for some, but not ex exist for others? Oh, well, he could show himself to some and not others. So in that sense, you could say, oh, he doesn't exist for some and for others. So he could limit his power in that kind of way. But no, it, no, no, he can't in that sort of way. That That's illogical. That's a fallacy. You got it. Thanks, Michelle Maria, for becoming a channel member. Just saw that in the chat. We appreciate your support. And this one from Happy Dome says... Matt, Christianity and Western culture are historically co-linked. The apostasy in Christianity coincides with falling birth rates and disintegration of Western culture. Cool. You got it. Joe Field says, want to let you know James is the real life giga chat. I appreciate that, Joe. Franco Trujillo says, face it, Matt. Oh, we got that one. Samir Farsane says, claims beautiful got that one just let me load these up in the meantime i want to remind you our guests are linked in the description box just loading up these other questions by the way folks we've got our, we're going to probably wrap up pretty soon so i want to say please don't send any more questions in though we appreciate all the questions you've sent so far and want to say as well i mentioned before our guests are linked in the description if you haven't checked them out please do and thunderstorm thanks for your question says no organization is 100 percent rational and has done harm is none are without failure, including science. I think they're saying like science scientists is not they're not always rational either, or maybe and that they also have had ethical failings. I think everybody would agree on that. The Muslim apologist has explained what is the Trinity. Oh, Stuart, you got Muslims coming after you now in the live chat with the questions. Explain what is the Trinity. <laughs> it's because of my intro. I brought some Muslims up in my intro. Um, so Father, Son, Holy Spirit. You can go the dimensions of the room. I wouldn't go with the egg illustration. There's a lot of bad illustrations out there. Um. It, it's just as problematic as your toeed, I think. And yet, like love, it's one of the biggest mysteries. But um, so it's one essence, Asusia, and yet different persons. And so I would say, I, I, would, I would go with the strain of theology that talks about that Jesus absolutely, you know, fighting against Arianism in the early first century, obviously Jesus wasn't fully just man when he was here on earth. He still had access, and that's he restrained his power at many different times, and yet he had his own personhood as well. So, same substance, different persons. You got it. And Endo, thanks so much. Says both is a belief, a choice. Can God force me to believe? Well, I don't think belief's ever a choice. I, I think you can choose to act as if you believe, um, but belief is the state of being convinced, and you can be convinced for good reasons or bad reasons, but I don't think that that becoming convinced is ever simply a matter of deciding I am now convinced in, in the sense of sort of like a conscious decision absent other uh, information. Can God make you believe? Well, the God character in the Bible definitely could in the same way that he hardened Pharaoh's heart or gave people over to reprobate minds and, and can control what people do. Pharaoh wanted to let people go, and God's like, nope, nope, I'm not done showing off yet, so I'm going to force you to act in a certain way. Um, whether or not he, he actually changed somebody's belief directly, um, I suppose that could be argued. I, I would suspect that that character, the way it's portrayed, could do that, but I don't know what Stuart thinks. Stuart? What's the question again? Can God force you to believe something? Oh, yes. God could force you to believe something. 
But again, that's that's the beauty of him giving us free will. He doesn't force us. But like Matt said, I believe a God could exist who would have created us to be sl- his own slaves, forced labor slaves. And, um, and unfortunately, he doesn't do that. And so we have free will. And so we have the options to to think through consciousness, abstract thinking, meaning, purpose, all these rationality questions that Matt and I have talked about in relation to Christianity tonight. If we didn't have these types, this type of free will, then we wouldn't be able to have this discussion. We don't have free will, not in that sense. But we can have that discussion another time. There we go. This one from Hillary D says, Stuart, do you know of the origin story of the talking snake that predates the Bible, as well as other versions in other places? Why is yours real when others predate it? Well, so the Enuma Elish and all those other ones, I, I mean, I, a lot of those, um, actually, the Germans, due to their racism, a lot of that came out of Germany. When was that? Late 1800s, I want to say, mid-1800s? In, in just trying to say that the, the Jews were totally wrong and look at all these different mythical cults that clearly were the right cults. So a lot of it came out of that. Others know are, are true and and closer to what um, what exactly looked like happened in the Garden of Eden. But I mean, look at the World Trade Center. I'm 45 minutes from it. A plane on the exact same day, a uh, very similar spot to a hit struck the World Trade Center, um, and then planes, you know, a number of years later, hit it as well. It, it, there's there's so many different ways of understanding that things can be similar, obviously. And yet, just because that happened first, obviously didn't make the, the second one wrong when, excuse me, uh, like it didn't happen um, when when it occurred on 9-11. So. That, that's actually surprising to me because I'm not going to put my Jesus hat back on again because I'm not trying to make anybody laugh. But That MAGA hat on you got, Matt. I see it back there. I don't. I have I have a I have a red hat that looks like a MAGA hat, but it says, I made you look. Black Lives Matter. Um <laughs> I also have a Darwin hat. You had me for a second. I, I, was, I, I, I was legitimately shocked. have that exact hat downstairs. I have Darwin hat. I have other hats. Um, I'm surprised at the answer, though, legitimately, because when I was a Christian, if somebody said, ah, these other things predate it, I would have had to say the surviving texts that tell that story may predate the surviving texts that went to made it the Bible. But because the Bible starts at the very beginning, in the beginning God created, there's nothing that can predate that. This this aspect of this story um, have, has been there since the beginning because it's true and it's spread in different ways. I, that, that would have been close to my answer back then. I'm surprised that yours is different. And don't forget the creation stories, even though there might be similarities there with that talking snake or the Enuma Elish, it's not even close the biblical creation story is all about you know, all it was created good as mentioned what 12 to 15 times and everything was good versus work came out of two different gods fighting it out and then the one that lost was was just demolished and all his different the parts of his body became soil in a way where you know we fight in the, in the soil and it's all violence all those different types of stories were based out of violence rather than goodness you got it. This one coming in from. Do appreciate it. Tim Zimlick says faith slash participation are prerequisites to miracles. Is that Matt? I think it was for Matt. All right. I apologize then. Do it again because it was kind of fast. No problem. They said faith slash participation are prerequisites to miracles. So if there, I don't even know what that means. Um, I, I don't know why there would – I would think if there was a prerequisite to a miracle, it would be the existence of some being capable of producing a miracle. Faith can't be a prerequisite to that because the the whether or not something happens um, is independent of your belief of it or your faith. So I don't understand that. Here you go, Stuart. <laughs> Get him out at Berkeley. <laughs> That's funny. That's pretty good. This one that from James That's W. Sweet. Says, after show, Matt Dillahunty, victory celebration at Amy Newman's channel. Starts after debate. This debate ends. Open mic. All welcome. Good job to the debaters and modern day debate. Thanks for your support, James W. And thanks, Amy, as well. Hope it goes yeah, thanks, well. Thanks, Amy, for trying to, to moderate earlier. Appreciate it. Agreed. 100%. Charles Leonard says, Matt, what is your definition of historical evidence? 
what is my definition of historical evidence? That's I think right. I probably need the context in which it's used, but basically it is uh, evidence from the past that is the best that we have currently. Well, it, it may not, I guess suppose it wouldn't necessarily be the best. So historical evidence is evidence that isn't necessarily empirically verifiable, but is reported from the past. And we can, uh, for historical claims, we can look at, um, for example, who's making the claim, how many different sources is it coming from, is it coming from competing sources, and the stronger, the, uh, the evidence is stronger when you have, for example, the losing side saying, here's what happened, and the winning side saying, here's what happened, and those are consistent, um, because we don't have a time machine. You got it. This one from Jashi T says to Matt in correct context. What about Jesus's teaching isn't rational in many people's opinion. The world would be uh, a better place. What about Jesus's teaching isn't rational. Um, well, if he's teaching that you should take no thought for the morrow and that you should, um, focus on an afterlife that hasn't been demonstrated, I would say that's grossly irrational and um, harmful. Because until such time as there's a good reason to think that there is an afterlife that you're going to go to, this is the one and only life that I know I'm going to get. And so telling me uh, that I should, that my primary focus of this life should be an afterlife that you haven't demonstrated, um, or the salvation of my soul, which you haven't demonstrated, um, I would say those are irrational. You got it. This one coming in from, do appreciate your question. Nick says, Matt, have you ever thought about what proof of God or the supernatural would look like? We definitely had yeah. that covered in the debate. What would that be for you? So this one from Noah, yeah. go ahead. So um, I've thought about it a lot, which is why I give the answer that annoys the crap out of a bunch of the people who debate me. Um, I'm not arrogant enough to presume that I would be able to, on my own, identify what evidence is sufficient to warrant believing in the supernatural. It's one of those things like where the Supreme Court, as somewhat of a dodge, would say, oh, we, we're not going to define pornography, but we know it when we see it. Um, I, I, I understand why they, they get to that point. And it's because if someone claims that something is supernatural in origin, the first thing that, needs to demo that we need to demonstrate is that there's actually an effect. The James Randi Educational Foundation for years had the million dollar challenge for anyone who made any claim that they could do anything that was supposedly supernatural. If you, you know, grab your dowsing rods, I've, I've got my dowsing rods right here, um, believe it or not. And you, you take your dowsing rods and you walk around and you're looking for whatever you're going to walk around. And when they cross, uh, supposedly that's the spot. And when they part or go other ways, it's that. Now, you can point out all day long how I can make these rods do whatever the hell I want, whenever I want. But there's a way to set up a test to demonstrate that these rods can be used to find things, whether it's water, gold, oil, whatever. And to date, no one has ever passed a preliminary test to demonstrate that these things actually do anything. Once you demonstrate that they do something, now the question becomes, how are they doing it? And until someone shows how we can investigate the supernatural, demonstrate that there is anything beyond the natural world, and that, that, that this thing that's beyond the natural world can in fact interact with reality in a detectable way, then we're stuck. And that means that everybody who is asserting supernatural causation is being irrational because they're claiming to verify a cause that is currently non-verifiable. You got it. This one from, do appreciate it. Austin King says, Matt, love you on the Hangup Show. Thanks for your positivity, Austin. Thanks. This one from Noah's Ark, Kansas says, if something alleviates your suffering or gives you purpose, would it be rational to believe in it? I think they're getting at William James's argument that sometimes it's practical. Then the, the argument that it's practical being a good reason to believe it. There are plenty of things that that are pragmatic beliefs that you may not have strong evidentiary warrant for. Um, like the, I don't have a solution to the problem of hard solipsism. And yet I believe that Stuart and I share a reality. Um, I have reasons for that. Like if in fact we don't, then I have written 
every great song and every bad song. I've I've made every wonderful painting and every crap painting. Um, I've been every uh, I've been every person who's taught me something that I didn't know at the same time as I didn't know it. And on those grounds, I find it, even though I can't demonstrate the truth of it, I find it more pragmatic to just accept that I share a reality with other people than to buck that direct experience and say, nope, I'm in a reality all to myself. This one coming in from, we got that one, I think. Let's, this come from Nathan Ducklow. It says, Matt, how do you deal with someone who is incapable or so biased to the point that you find it hard to persuade them? So I think they're saying the people that seem to be unpersuadable, what's your strategy to try to persuade? I don't. I mean, so here, this is not going to be a surprise to anybody, I don't think. I'm happy to convince Stuart that he's wrong. But I didn't come here to do that. And I didn't come here with the expectation that it was going to happen or it was likely. I have atheist friends who are like, oh, Stuart's this close to becoming an atheist. I have no idea if that's true. Um, I, I, I'd be fine with it either okay. way because I'd, I'd rather watch Stuart think and try to come up with a rational uh, justification for what he believes and realize the importance of it than wind up with another atheist. I'm happy also if, if he became an atheist. My goal is to come here. Today's debate was, is Christianity rational? There, I'm sure there were people in chat who were like, oh, Matt didn't talk about his worldview. Correct, my worldview is not on trial today. Um, Christianity is. Well, why didn't you do this? Well, because it wasn't relevant. I didn't want to distract. All I'm here to do is to present skepticism, secular humanism, and atheism as, from my perspective as to what my take is on the issue. And that the issue is, is Christianity rational? What yeah. I like, what I want, what I prefer, what I believe, what I suspect, what my biases are, are completely irrelevant to whether or not Christianity can or has demonstrated rationality. And I'm talking about rationality as uh, a demonstration that the claims of Christianity are consistent with the facts of reality. Anything that is not consistent with the facts of reality, for example, is it rational to believe that ghosts are real? Well, Ghosts are inconsistent with the facts of reality. Yes, we have reports of people who claim they've experienced ghosts. How did they identify that what they experienced was actually a ghost? They didn't. They can't. They don't have any mechanism to demonstrate the conclusion that they've reached. And that's my point. That's why I'm here. You got it. This one coming in from. Do appreciate it. Noob Noob says, can God microwave a burrito so hot that not even he can eat it? That's an old one. But nonetheless, thank you very much. This one from Polarity says, Matt says God exists. And we know it, but not which religion was right. Would the amount of people in a specific religion then give more credence to the claim since God would or could or might influence people to come to one particular religion in greater numbers? I, I don't understand what that's saying. I think they're saying... Uh, let's say granting that God exists, would numbers possibly be evidence, namely the numbers of adherents for a particular religion, no. because possibly no. God would be expected no. to draw nope. people to the correct one. Now, the truth, the truth isn't impacted anyway by the number of people who believe something or how sincerely or how strong their convictions are. Um, would it be the case that uh, a lot of people believing something is consistent, is, is, uh, correlated with that thing existing, yes, but it's not causal. And so the plural of anecdote isn't data. The more people who believe something or believe something strongly does not tell you in any way whether or not it's true. And this is something that Stuart brought up many, many times, um, talking about you know how rapidly it spread or uh, literally almost everything. I even, I even noted it down here in the notes after I went through the list of things that he said. All of these are about how people found it convincing. The spread of Christianity is because people found it convincing, but that isn't confirmation that those people were rational or that their beliefs were true. The You've popularity, got... that's a, an argumentum ad populum, and it is a fallacy. Cultural mm -hmm. flexibility, though, would be one. Cultural flexibility. How, how does we'll that- Sit on that, we'll come back to it. How does that demonstrate the ration? Oh, well, I, we got questions, so. 
This one coming in from, do appreciate it, Otangelo Grasshole. I think this is a parody account of Otangelo. I don't know. They say Matt Dillhunty have you, has not debunked the Shroud of Turin. The Shroud destroys atheists and proves that Jesus uh, proves Jesus. Is not possible to prove Shroud, not real atheism, lose bad. Cool. Uh, two quick things. Uh, first of all, cultural flexibility. We are culture, and that's still a result of what we find convincing, and it isn't a demonstration of rationality. But to answer this question, Stuart, is the Shroud of Turin real or a fraud? I'm 30% on it. You're, you're 30% on it being a fraud or 30% on it being real? Real. Okay. So even Stuart isn't to the 50% point, but... Uh, Joe Nickel and others have already demonstrated pretty conclusively from the availability of being able to examine it um, that the Shroud of Turin isn't real. But here's the thing that you can ask yourself. Let's assume that the Shroud of Turin were real. And so you have a god who did all these things. And then there's a shroud, which is evidence of that. And yet it isn't available to be examined. It hasn't been conclusively demonstrated to be true. And if it were, it would be undeniable and it would be the sort of evidence that Stuart says God won't provide because that sort of conclusive proof would be too coercive. And so on every single grounds, the, the Shroud of Turns of Fraud. <laughs> this one coming in from Austin King says, Matt, what games are you playing currently? None. I'm in a debate, but I'm taking your question at face value. Uh, I stream on Twitch and I've been playing uh, Magic the Gathering and Valorant primarily um, and some miscellaneous board games. I've been busy with a lot of projects. I mean, we're, we're doing this uh, exotic pet business as well. So That's right. I heard about that last time Arn was on. That's pretty cool. I think I did. This one coming in from... Oh, we got that. Noah's Arkansas says, I like the big words Matt uses. Don't understand them, though, because I am slow. <laughs> All right. I think they're being sarcastic. No, Ken I Hoven. try not to use them. I mean, I, my ex-wife used to be. does debunk them, this. though. What, what's that? I said you do debunk them, though. Yeah, except for solipsism. I didn't debunk <laughs> that. We, this... we, we were going with two different usages. Two deaths. So. I like that. Ken <laughs> Tobin's. All. Ken Tovin, CPA, I don't think this is his actual accountant, says Patrick Mahomes will beat the Bengals with one leg. Thank you for that. Ryan C. says, so if one isn't consistent with the facts of reality, how can mathematics be so consistent with the facts of reality? If you One want someone... is consistent with the facts of reality. The fact that it's an abstract concept doesn't mean it's inconsistent with the facts of reality. Um, there's a quantity right here, and the quantity of wallets in my hand is what we call one. It doesn't matter that it's an abstract concept, or the, the label, the quantity of wallets in my hand is one. You got it. This one from also Ryan C. Email me at moderndaydebate at gmail.com because they also issued a challenge to a debate, Matt. And Noah's Ark Kansas says, is forgiveness injustice? Would you define the core principle? What would you define the core principles as? I think they mean core principles of injustice, but I'm not sure. I don't think forgiveness is injustice. You got it. This one from Nick says, Matt, if you knew that you were going to die, would you pray? Would you think that, uh, would you think about praying or would you make the decision to avoid it altogether? Yeah. You see this mark here a year ago in December. So a year and a month ago, I had open heart surgery for a triple bypass. I didn't pray. It's very likely that I could have died on the table. It's very likely that I would have never regained consciousness. I didn't pray. I have no interest in praying. Hey, folks. Sorry about that. During the Q&A, we actually had the internet connection here where I am drop, and then we lost touch with the speaker. So this is a post-announcement after the debate to say, unfortunately, the Q&A was cut short. And so we are sorry that we lost communication with both of the speakers. And so that is it for the debate. That's the reason for the sudden ending. But want to say thanks so much for your support. We really do appreciate it here at Modern Day Debate, as well as want to say 
As mentioned earlier, if you are able to follow us at TikTok, it means more than you know. As you can see at the bottom right of your screen, once we hit 1,000 followers on TikTok, we unlock the feature of being able to live stream there, which is a huge deal as we're going to be live streaming our debates there as we want to expand this neutral platform so that debates just like this can be seen. Our link to our TikTok is pinned at the top of the chat. It's also at the very top of the description box, so you can conveniently click on there and follow us as we really do appreciate that support as we continue our march to 1,000 followers there as we just got on TikTok and we had like about a six month, one year hiatus and then started getting active on it again once we found out we'd be able to live stream there. So thanks so much for your support, for following us there. I want to say if you happen to be uh, in terms of want to say as well. So thanks for all of your support. And thank you very much in the uh, live chat. I, I have to warn you guys, folks, I'm sorry. I don't want to lead you along and uh, mislead you. I don't think that we're going to have a... Uh, Stewart come back. I'm going to wait a little bit, but let me just double check in case I missed him. Yeah, I have a feeling that we might not hear back from Stewart, and I don't blame him because it's freaking late. It's 11 there, so that guy's already, it's already been three hours. That's just too long, so I don't think we're going to see him. Ozzy Gold, thanks for your support. Says, thanks for your time, debaters, and modern day debate for your work putting them together. Thanks for that. That seriously means more than you know, buddy. Seriously, we do appreciate it. Thanks for all of your support as it's been a juicy one. It's been a fun one. We do appreciate both of our guests, Matt and Stuart. And want to say thanks for all of you in the, the old live chat there. Thanks for all of your support. Is this especially technology-wise? We had some bumps along the way, as you know, both in terms of OBS first and then also in terms of my connection here. But want to say hi to you in the old live chat. And Mon, thanks for coming by. I see you there in the old live chat. Jack has. Paul Amir, let me know if I'm saying that right. Thanks for coming by. I see you there in the live chat. Nathias, thanks for coming by. I see you there. What? Good to see you again. And Joe R. Dim, am I saying it right? Let me know. Thanks for coming by. Troll, glad to have you here, as well as HM. I think Troll's like trying to like trigger people in the live chat. So like, look out, folks. Like, oh, okay. So this one, uh, into the break. Thanks for coming by. As well as Poker Man, good to see you there. Crystal Rock, happy to have you here. And Gross Patat, glad to have you with us. Dylan Motes, good to see you. Michael Stein, thanks for being here. DJ Batman, good to see you again. Says, keep up the great debates. Thanks, DJ Batman. And I was told to make you a moderator. I guess you went through the gauntlet to become one, so I just made you a mod in the YouTube live chat. want to say thanks for your support. Now, for those of you who don't know, I want to mention, as mentioned, Amy is doing an after show that's one thing that's going to be going on shortly. And in addition to that, you could open up more than one tab because maybe you're like, oh, yeah, I want to do more than one thing. Of course you do. Who, who wouldn't blame you to want to both see the after show as well as I'm going to put the debate. Wait, what is going on? Man, is my internet cracking out again? I'm going to look up the debate between Stuart and Matt in the past is that was a popular debate. If you haven't seen it, Stuart and Matt already debated on, it was a broader, different question. It was one of whether or not, uh, uh, debate on whether or not God exists, or whether or not there's good evidence for God. That was a great debate in the past. So I have to encourage you, if you haven't checked that out, that's a really popular one. That's one of our more popular ones. Want to encourage you to check that out. So let me pull that up. And I'm going to put that link to last debate years ago between Matt and Stuart. If you want to watch that, you can. So I highly encourage you to check that out. But yes, this debate is going to be, this is going to be, we're going to put this on private shortly because this debate was a technological, what's the word I'm looking for? Let me use a poised word. We had some technical challenges, but no problem. We're going to get over it. So I want to say thanks to Amy for all of your support and trying to make it work earlier. As well as Gigi in the chat says, thanks for the show, Modern Day Debate. Sad evidence. Let's see. Thanks for your support. Ember, good to see you there. I see you there in the old live chat. Glad to, glad to have you. As well as, let's see. Troll, I can't tell if Troll is a robot, like a bot or a real person. I don't know. No offense, Troll, <laughs> but I just can't tell. But what want to say thanks for your support, you guys. You make this fun. I want to give you our quick pitch before we go because it's getting late. 
in particular, modern day debate. If you haven't yet, hit that subscribe button as well, folks. Thanks for all of your support. Modern day debate is a neutral platform. Our vision, our goal, what we're determined to do is provide a neutral platform so that everybody has their chance to make their case on a level playing field. That's what we're determined to do. That's what we're doing here on YouTube and what we're doing at the podcast. If you haven't checked us out, you can search for us on your favorite podcast app. We're on every podcast app for real. We're out there. As well as what we are going to be or already are doing on Twitch and what we're going to be doing on TikTok shortly. So I want to say if you support that, uh, yeah, I may, might as well say it now. There are other ways of supporting Modern Day Debate if you'd like. First, before talking about those, I want to mention we do have a new Discord. Did you know that, folks? I highly encourage you. If you haven't checked out the new Discord, do check out the new Discord. For real. It's in the description box. What are you waiting for? Check that out right now. As well as we do have a Patreon. That's in the description box as well. That's something a lot of people don't know about. We really don't talk about it a lot just because we kind of forget. So I want to say we do appreciate it. If you support us on Patreon, that means a lot. And... Not only that, but channel memberships. That's another way you can support Modern Day Debate. We appreciate that support. As well as we have an Amazon referral link. So if you use, I don't know if this still works. I think it still works. If you use the Amazon referral link, yeah, it does still work because it's not Amazon Smile. So it's just the affiliate thing where basically if you use our Amazon link in the description box and then make a purchase, like 2 or 3% or something like that goes to Modern Day Debate because we referred you to monitor to uh, Amazon. Also, if you have Amazon Prime, here's another thing. You actually, if you have Amazon Prime, you have a free Twitch subscription that you can use on any creator once a month. You have to go in and renew it each month. So in other words, like basically you can subscribe to Modern Day Debate on Twitch and that helps us because $5 of the $5, $2.50 goes toward Modern Day Debate. And that's for free. So like you don't pay, it's like that's just complimentary with your Amazon Prime membership. You can follow us on Twitch and subscribe to Modern Day Debate. And then that's $2.50 that goes to Modern Day Debate each month that you decide to subscribe to us. Because you have to go, keep going back every month to do it. So it doesn't automatically renew on its own. And like I said, that's complimentary. So you have that subscription to use on Twitch, whether you use it or not. Like you don't, it makes no difference to what, what you pay for your Prime membership, the Prime membership is the same no matter what. It's just a complimentary or extra membership you can use if you want. <sighs> but I want to say, if you didn't know this, if you want to come on to Modern Day Debate, that is a little thing that we have in the description box. There's a link to a Google page that talks about like what kind of the pr process is for that potentially happening. Well, we, we don't take every topic. Some topics, we just don't feel like they really engage the audience. And so we're kind of like, nah, it's just not really going to work. And we also, of course, it takes time. Like for me to moderate a debate, it takes like usually an hour and a half at minimum. And in this case tonight, it's been about three and a half or about three hours. So <sighs> thanks for all of your support, though, you guys. I love you guys. want to say thanks for being here. Thanks for making this channel awesome. If you haven't already, here's another thing. Lastly, if you haven't yet consider sharing this debate for real that really does help a ton if you love these debates uh this link to this debate is going to disappear so because this video is going to go on private so if you want to share them the channel the youtube channel uh that can help us grow our neutral platform as we want to give everybody a fair shot whether they be atheist christian muslim all of the other groups, you name it. We hope everybody uh, gets a fair shot. We want to say thanks so much for all of your support, you guys. Keep sifting out the reasonable from the unreasonable. I'm going to let you go now because, unfortunately, I can't blame him. Stuart probably fell asleep because it's so late there now. And then uh, Matt said he had to go. So I want to say thanks for your support, though, you guys. I love you. Thanks for making this fun. I love getting to say hi to you in the chat like this. Ozzy Gold says, you could host Standing for Truth versus Based Theory. Juicy. That sounds fun. If they want to do it on Modern Day Debate, I'm open to it. Psychological Shackle Breakers, thanks for coming by. I see you there in the old live chat. As well as Kata Jabril, good to see you. Ember, glad to have you with us. Michael Stein, happy you're here. Brandon Johnson, thanks for dropping in. Jeremy Nolan, thanks for being a channel member. Seriously, that means a lot. We appreciate your support. Good to see you in the old live chat. Samir Farsain, good to see you there. I see you there in the live chat. Thanks for your super chats, brother. It means a lot. Andres Castanos, thanks for coming by. And everybody else as well. Thanks, Amy, for your support uh, with that TikTok link. And t Base Theory says, I'm down for it. All right, well, Base Theory, if you email me, I mean, has Standing for Truth already said that he would debate you? 
I'm at moderndaydebate at gmail.com. Uh, write that down, based theory, because my we're going to end the stream in a second, so write that down. Uh, but yeah, base theory, did moder- did a standing for truth already agree? I don't know, because I, I don't know if he's going to. He's, he turns down a lot of debates. He doesn't really, he hasn't come on here for a long time to debate. He usually just does it on his own channel. DP, thanks for your kind words, man. Seriously, I see they're in the live chat. That means a lot. Thanks for your encouragement. Non-existent. Good to see you. Thanks for dropping in. Destiny's Crack Dealer, good to see you again. Glad you're back. But yeah, thanks you guys. You make this fun. I appreciate you guys. I love you guys. We'll see you at the next one. Keep sifting out the reasonable from the unreasonable. And we'll see you at the next debate. We have many coming up. So if you haven't yet, hit hit that subscribe button. And thanks for your support.